Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee. Today is Thursday, November 29th, and uh, my name is Councilmember Alondra Cano, and I am the chair of this committee. And with me are Council Members Ellison, Fletcher, Cunningham, and Palmisano. Together, we are a quorum of this committee, and therefore, we shall be able to conduct official business today. We are very excited to have you here. This is our last meeting of the year, uh, but you're gonna be able to see us more next year because we will start meeting twice a month instead of just once. So in our agenda today, we have a receive and file, which is our uh, public comment period. We have a, um, a series of consent items that I will read after the um, public uh, comment period um, is over. And then we have two public hearings. One is on the reappointment of our chief of police. Our second one is a powers and duties of the fire chief and fire department activities ordinance. And then we have two discussion items. Uh, one is a corresponder pilot project report. And then uh, the second one is a uh, classification of and access to police body camera data. So um, do we have any questions on the agenda before we approve it? Seeing no questions, um, let's go ahead and approve this agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And we shall begin. I will note that we have been joined by Council Vice President Andrea Jenkins. Thank you so much. And so um, we will begin with our uh, 30 minutes of public comment, which is a, a standard public comment period that we have built into this uh, committee every session that we meet. And so this is to welcome uh, folks who wanna speak to the committee on any uh, range of topics relating to public safety and emergency management. And so if you are here for the uh, uh, public hearing um, on uh, the chief of police appointment or the powers and duties of the fire chief, uh, that will come later. So don't feel like you have to jump in now. Uh, so for this um, specific section, it, it does look like we have a sign-in sheet. And so we will begin with Mr. Chuck Turchik, followed by Ms. Loretta Van Pelt. So if Mr. Turchik is here, please go ahead and address the committee. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Chuck Turchik and I live 2112 Portland. Uh, thank you for appointing Lacey Schumacher as one of the two new members of the Police Conduct Oversight Commission. It's often helpful to have an attorney on that commission. Oh, wait a second. Isn't the commission chair Andrea Brown an attorney? Oh, and isn't commission vice chair Jennifer Singleton an attorney too? And isn't Commissioner Bischoff an attorney too? And isn't Commissioner Feruzan also an attorney? And isn't Commissioner Westfall an attorney? Yep, after these appointments, six of the eight commissioners on the PCLC will be attorneys. And the other two will be public employees, one with the Minnesota State Colleges and University Systems and one with Hennepin County. Come on, shouldn't this body be a little more occupationally reflective of the residents of Minneapolis? Are 75% of Minneapolitans attorneys and the other 25% public employees? I do not mean to demean the work of the PCOC, the PCOC has done so far or to suggest the five attorneys currently sitting on the seven member commission are only trying to build their resumes. They are all fine people who have gone well beyond what one would expect from citizen volunteers and how much work they do. But appearances are important too. And a police conduct oversight commission with six attorneys and two public employees does not give the best appearance. This attorney and public employee heavy body is probably the result of the Civil Rights Department six plus years ago, emphasizing that people sought for the then new PCLC and police conduct review panel would be people with quote, a set of higher analytical skills. The implication was that the people who had served on the CRA board, people who were overwhelmingly non-attorneys, did not have those, quote, higher analytical skills. Nonsense. For a citizen commission that deals with such high profile, hot button issues as police oversight and police accountability, you can, you should do better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turchik. And now we will have, um, Ms. Van Pelt, come up to the microphone. Uh, my name is Loretta Van Pelt. I live in uh, South Minneapolis, and I um, am an organizer with Twin Cities Coalition Justice for Jamar. And um, I came here today um, to talk about um, holding the cops accountable for when 
they murder someone and it's ha it hasn't been happening and we've had now in the last two years three shootings <laughs> and no cop has been held accountable for that. And so today I'm just um, back again to say, and I've been here before and I'm gonna say it again, that we need community control of the police. That we no longer can accept that uh, cops getting the slaps on the wrist, that the community should have a say on how that goes, not the powers that be in the city anymore, because obviously mm -hmm. we're seeing that justice. So I'm just here again to say that uh, we need community control of the police. We need, um, and then also, um, I read a little bit about this co-responder pri pilot project. I also feel that that should be in the hands of uh, mental health professionals, because this last shooting, we saw how the cops handled that as well. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to invite Miss Pedersen, and after that, um, Jenny, I'm sorry, I can't read the last name, but if we can get those folks ready. So we'll have uh, Miss Emma Pedersen. Peterson. Yeah, it's Peterson. Peterson, yeah, thank My you. name is Emma Peterson, um, and I am here today to um, give you guys a, a short story about an uh, experience that I had with my family a couple weeks ago. Uh, we were driving over the 35W bridge, you know, where it goes on the off-ramp to 4th Street towards the U of M. And uh, while we were there, we saw two people on top of the bridge, and they were struggling, and it looked like one of them was about to go over. So we pulled over, and we called the cops. Um, and then the, the car moved um, up and went off the off-ramp, and then the passenger got out of the car and started running. So we caught up to these people, and we caught up to the driver, and she was in crisis. Um, and it turned out that the passenger was her girlfriend, um, and she was trying to commit suicide. Um, so we had called the cops again and um, told them what it was going on, um, and three different departments showed up to this incident. The U of M police, the Minneapolis police, and then the state patrol. Um, the police officers stayed for about 10 minutes. They um, just looked on their cameras. They didn't see anything. They didn't see the girl, and they continued on with their day. Um, my family, my godmother, and my sister and I spent the next 45 minutes looking to help find this girl. Um, as somebody who wants to go into law enforcement, um, I found that the reaction of these police officers was frankly really frustrating and disappointing that they only spent 10 minutes <coughs> responding to someone in crisis. And I think that's relevant to the topic today about the co-responder model. I think um, the expansion of the co-responder model would be really useful, especially for people in North Minneapolis um, and other parts of the city as well. Um, but we also need to think about uh, our standards for police officers in general. Um, this situation was something where police officers could have made a difference in somebody's lives, and they didn't do that that day. Um, so just something for you to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we will have um, Jenny come up to the microphone, and then uh, followed by uh, Tamara Russell. Hello, my name is Jennifer Gilreath, and because I'm ill, I'm not going to speak for very long, but I'm a co-chair of the Racial Justice Committee Network, our um, criminal justice committee, and we have been reaching out to some of you via email, and you have all gotten the statement that the Racial Justice Network sent you via email as well as left a copy today, and I'm here to request that you immediately put into place number two and number three, and number two addresses disciplining COPS, Minneapolis Police Department, since that is one of your roles, is writing the policies and oversight of that committee that does that. Um, because when you look at the police that are involved in some of the killings of our community members, they have discipline records. If you look at Robert Kroll himself, he has over 39 um, complaints against him and over seven lawsuits. And then if you, the other part is number three, is to immediately put the co-responder mental health program into place in North Minneapolis. Um, because with, in, within the last 12 months now, Marcus Fisher was shot by police, almost killed here in City Hall in their interview rooms. He miraculously survived. Um, and then later on last summer, Thurman Blevins as well, was killed by police, and then now Travis Jordan. And the police that responded to Travis Jordan, they knew it was a mental health situation that was going on, that he was suicidal. 
Um, and two rookies responded who had only been on the force for 11 months. And our partners together, that doesn't make any sense why they are the ones responding. And it should be mental health people that are responding. Um, you have people with mental health issues that are in hospitals, in treatment centers, all sorts of places that are suicidal. And um, when they're having a crisis are not shot and killed by the people trying to help them. There's no reason that police should be responding and killing people when they're in need. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Tamara Russell, followed by Mr. Pete Gamades. Hi, my name's Tamara Russell. I'm here because I lost my son because of affordable housing and the criminal justice system. We don't need more jails, more guards. We need criminal justice reform. He could not find affordable housing. He was living in North Minneapolis. The landlady didn't even ask him his name when she rented to him. She was renting to five people in a small house. There was no heat, there was no air conditioning. He was paying 450 a month for a room. I found him deceased. They didn't call an ambulance. The officer just walked in and shook his head and said, can't anyone here smell? He only in asked the landlady. He didn't question anyone else. He said, everyone go outside. They came, one of them came walking out with his wallet and he held it up in the air. He said, I have your son's wallet and there's cash in it. I never, I said, can I have it back? He didn't answer me, he just got in the car. And the homicide detective was there for probably two minutes. They were very rude to me and they didn't investigate at all. My daughter called there, they said if they would seal the room, which they didn't. The next day I had my younger son and daughter go down there to get his papers because he was a writer. And the landlady was in there cleaning the room. And she said, oh, can I keep the dishes and the hangers? That's all she said. They didn't say they were sorry or anything. And I called all day trying to find his wallet. Finally, they said I had to go to internal affairs. I called them time after time, and they'd make excuses. They said, oh, that officer works nights. Me and my younger son went down and interviewed with internal affairs and they interviewed us separately. They only showed me three pictures and they kept insisting that it was a black officer, which there was no black officer there. The fourth precinct is the worst precinct. I know not all officers are bad, but a lot of them are gun happy and they just like to kill suicidal people. I don't understand why they can't shoot them in the arm or the leg. Why do they have to shoot them 20 times? We need more mental health programs. My son had PTSD and TBI. He had a lot of childhood trauma. He lost his father when he was five. And I would like to see criminal justice reform. We need more drug treatments, drug courts. Every time he wasn't a hardened criminal, he tried to get in public housing and he was so happy and then the man called back and said, oh, there's no way you can reside here. He wasn't a hardened criminal. He had never hurt anybody. He would get picked up for having an open bottle. And every time they would fine him $200 for having an open bottle. He never hurt anybody. He wasn't a sex offender. The first time he went to jail, the guard called me and they said, oh, he's having panic attacks. I got him a lawyer and a mental health worker but they wouldn't do anything. People with mental health and substance abuse problems do not need to be in jail. They need help. And this is a crisis, affordable housing. What's going on with the Native Americans, which are not immigrants, how they have to live. We need a Dorothy Day Center in Minneapolis. They don't need it. My son would never go to uh, he went to St. Stephen's. They wouldn't help him. They said he had to have proof that he was in the shelter. 
He wouldn't go to a shelter. He'd sleep on the street before he'd go to a shelter. I'd go down there and spend the night in the car with him. He did get in Mission Farms, which does have a very good program. It's overcrowded, but there's plenty of land there where they could expand. I th we need mental health and substance abuse treatment. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. We have Mr. Pete Gamades, followed by Sonia Muse. Hello, my name is Pete Gamadis. I live in Northeast Minneapolis. Uh, thank you, council members. I'm also part of the Racial Justice Network, and I wanted to reiterate the five uh, demands that we have in relation to the police killing of Travis Jordan. Um, first, and we want to have a public hearing on the specific protocols and procedures that led to the most recent <coughs> shooting and accounting of where whether the policies were violated. We want a plan to rid all uh, officers with history of violence towards uh, civilians out of the MPD. Uh, an immediate extension of the uh, MPD mental health co-responder program to North Minneapolis. Uh, plan to eliminate the reliance on the BCA for investigating shootings and, ad and identify a credible entity uh, that can do such investigations. And finally, a plan to increase transparency and immediately release the body camera footage in police case shootings, affording the citizens the same rights that the officers have. We just want to understand when uh, officers are going to be held accountable for the violence that they have in the community. We know that six time, uh, black people are six times more likely to be stopped for equipment violations in the city of Minneapolis, and once they are, they're four times more likely to be searched. We need your support, we need the chief's support, the inspector's support to end this practice. This is discriminatory, and we need to do better as a city. And as council members, I know there's always a disagreement of what power you have over the police department, but right now you have the budget power, and I want, we ask that you use your budget power to implement changes within the police department that will make the city a better place for all of its residents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, Sonia Moose, Muse up next. Hi, my name is Sonia Moose, and I am a resident of North Minneapolis. I just bought a house there um, this past June, and thank you for your time in hearing us out. I want to echo and honor what was said before me, as my message is very similar. I'm also a co-chair of the Criminal Justice Committee within the Racial Justice Network, and we are here today, um, and I'm going to, re to reiterate these five demands that we have. Number one, a public hearing on the specific protocols and procedures that led to the most recent police shootings. Number two, a plan to rid MPD of officers with a history of violence, which is something that can be implemented immediately. Number three, immediate extension of MPD mental health co-responder program to North Minneapolis. Number four, a plan to eliminate reliance upon the BCA for investigating shootings by police. And number five, a plan to increase transparency. Um, I have just moved to the city. I grew up in the suburbs, and I'm excited to be living in the Minneapolis community. But it's important to me that I'm able to call the police and other mental health support without feeling like I'm in fear of my life or people that I love or live by are in fear of their lives. Thank you. Thank you. That was our last registered speaker for the public comment period. If there are other folks who would like to speak, this would be the time to come up. And then you can just announce your name and then sign in over there after you're done. So if we have other folks who want to share, not seeing any more. All right. So we shall go ahead and receive and file these uh, public comments. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> Thank you. And now we will go ahead and... Uh, Take a look at the consent agenda. Item number two is a contract with Blue Pictures LLC to film Minneapolis Police Department women in law enforcement. Item number three is the 2018 Emergency Management Management Performance Grant. Item number four is a 2018 Urban Area Security Initiative Grant from the Department of Homeland Security. <clears throat> Item number five an agreement with the State of Minnesota with the Office of State Court Administration for Court Data Services. 
Item number six is a contract with the Downtown Improvement District policing during the holidazzle. Item number seven is authorizing a contract with Horseman Inc. for mounted patrol boarding service services. And item number eight is approving a Police Conduct Oversight Commission appointments. And what we will do is go ahead and take all these items um, under consent approval, except for item number two, which we will uh, delay by two cycles. Uh, if there are any questions, um, we can take questions now. Uh, yes, uh, Council Vice President. Thank you, Chair Cano. Um, <clears throat> I was just curious about item number four, the 2018 Urban Area Security Initiative Grant from the Department of Homeland Security. I'm wondering if um, someone from the police department can explain what that grant will entail. If, it, if anyone from the appropriate department is here to address this, please go ahead and, and take the uh, microphone. Uh, my name is Alec Bruns. I'm the Finance and Admin Section Chief with the Office of Emergency Management. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, one of our primary grants that we uh, received from the Department of Homeland Security through the state. Uh, and it is used to address um, all of our, our response and preparation, as well as mitigation and recovery from acts of terrorism and other hazards. Um, and we use this grant to support a lot of our office administration, but also uh, for projects uh, for doing exercises to help us prepare for activities, as well as uh, kind of helping facilitate and coordinate other department projects uh, for needs that they see for addressing acts of terrorism. Um, so does that include equipment? It does, yep. Uh, so it includes uh, everything from planning and organizing, uh, but also equipment, training, and exercising. And are you familiar with what types of equipment, or is it yes. specific uh, to so particular events? For uh, this upcoming grant, the equipment that we've approved for it uh, includes um, some of our warehouse cash items that we can use to respond to uh, large events, uh, disasters, or acts of terrorism, as well as um, support of uh, Minneapolis Police Department has asked for $25,000 for a field watch application that they'll use during Final Four. And then finally, uh, the Municipal Building Commission has asked for uh, $37,000 for uh, improving target hardening of City Hall to include um, CCTV cameras. Thank you very much. All righty. So um, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda items with item number two being delayed by two cycles, please say aye. 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 And those <clears throat> items uh, move forward. So we are now going to start the uh, public hearing component of our meeting. And our first public hearing is for the, uh, for the consideration of the reappointment by the executive committee of Mr. Madaria Arredondo to the appointed position of Chief of Police Department for a three-year term beginning January 2nd, 2019. And we do have, we'll start with the speakers, correct? Miss um, Clerk, okay. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and do um, the, there's a number of folks who have signed in and we will start with uh, Mr. Chuck Turchik followed by Mr. Al Flowers. Madam Chair, committee members, Chuck Turchik, same address. Uh, democracy is about process. I am a process freak, and this process sucks. A Minneapolis City ordinance gives the Police Conduct Oversight Commission the power to, quote, participate in the performance review of the Chief of Police, unquote. I assume the mayor conducted such a performance review before deciding to nominate Chief Arredondo for reappointment. If he didn't, he should have, and this reappointment should be held up for that hard to understand reason. 
But if one was conducted, the PCLC played absolutely no role in that performance review, and in fact, for it, the entire six years of its existence has played no such role. Why is this important? Two reasons. First, the Civilian Review Authority was likewise never asked for its legislatively granted input on performance reviews of the chief. So on its own, it began issuing yearly documents called Participation in the Performance Review of the Chief of Police. And that's why the CRA was transformed into the OPCR and PCOC, PCOP. Every time you preclude the PCOC from participating in these performance reviews, you are similarly disrespecting the civilian oversight body you created. And the second reason this is important is because one party rule has a tendency to ignore or short circuit the processes laid out in statutes and ordinances. We've seen that for two years on the national level and with essentially one party rule in Minneapolis, you'd be doing the same thing on a local level. You ought to return this appointment to the executive committee, suggest that they return their appointment to the mayor with a request to follow the process as intended by city ordinances. That is to involve the PCLC and allow that commission to participate in the performance review of the chief that led to the mayor's nominating him for reappointment. Democracy is about process. I am a process freak. And should you move to approve or disapprove this reappointment today, this process will continue to suck. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Turchik. Mr. Al Flowers, followed by Mr. Joseph Finley. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair uh, Connell and uh, the rest of the City Council. Uh, uh, first of all, I've, I've already expressed, I think uh, Chief Paradondo is one of the greatest things Minneapolis have did over the uh, past 25, 30 years. So to even say hold up the appointment, I'm not going to even get up uh, into that. This is uh, one of the greatest chiefs you're probably going to have. And I know our community is uh, comfortable. Uh, I've talked to uh, faith base, all kind of leaders, and we, we know it's the right one. And we think things can change for our community as African American. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. I, I just want to uh, 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 tell uh, Vice President uh, Jenkins uh, about number four, I, I would like to look know a little more about what's that urban that urban part. What are, where are they talking about uh, 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 doing this? That they got urban in there, that uh, strategic planning for urban areas, and what does that mean from Homeland Security? I, I'm, I'm trying to figure figure that out. So we'll and we'll study that. We got time to figure out what they're doing. But I think your question was legit in asking what is this. I'm glad you pulled that out. And then uh, I, I just. Uh, I want to say I, I want to take a little time to uh, talk about the what happened, uh, what's happening on the borders of the country, and what's happening to kids getting pepper sprayed and, and things like that. And that uh, the, so my uh, I got a great compassion for what's happening in the immigrant community. I talked to my good friend uh, uh, over here, Hershey, uh, and uh, and I'm all about immigrants. But I'm, I'm, I want to say this: you got uh, about this municipal ID. You're going to give municipal IDs uh, to people and and uh, and you know undocumented uh, people. I know what it's about and what you're trying to do. And you got it uh, uh, ongoing that this is going to go in the budget. And we've been sitting there crying about our violence and where you could put something in the community and to our community, in our community, the African American community, ongoing, just like you did that. It's what your priorities is. And somebody said earlier, you have the you have the budget. You have the budget, and this I, I'm saying to you guys, I, I think we got a great opportunity here to really make some amends in our city if you, uh, if, if you work with uh, the communities like you worked on this uh, bill for this uh, municipal ID, and you all all agree, and you put the money there. Put something into what we're talking about, about the violence in our community and the housing, and let us work, <laughs> let's, let us all work together. And I would support I would support that, but I think we're being cheated as African Americans. You can find that to do municipal IDs, but you can't find stuff while we're dying. So I'm I'm gonna keep saying this, and I'll be at the city council all in 2019. I'm gonna keep fighting for our kids' life, and I'm gonna work with the police uh, because I believe in this chief. I believe in this deputy chief. I know they want to do the right thing. It's gonna be hard. This ain't gonna be easy. It's gonna be hard, but we can do it. We can do it. I'm saying that. Thank you, Mr. Flowers. We'll have Mr. Joseph Finley, followed by Mr. Michael English. 
Joseph Finley, 1350 Nicollet <coughs> Avenue. Uh, Mr. Chairwoman, uh, committee members, thank you. And I, I'm here to speak in uh, support of Chief Rondo's reappointment. I'm speaking not only as a private ordinary citizen, but as a representative for my neighborhood. I've lived in Minneapolis for over 40 years and have been a resident of the Loring Park neighborhood for 20 years. The past six years, I have uh, chaired the Livability Committee of our neighborhood association, which is Citizens for Loring Park Community. Along with being involved with uh, that committee, I have helped I helped to bring to life the Loring Park Neighborhood's Nicollet Safety Coalition, made up of property owners, management, business owners, block leaders, the Minneapolis Police Department, First Precinct, Hennepin County, St. Stephen Street Outreach, and many others who have a stake in the safety of the Nicollet Corridor and the surrounding area in our neighborhood. This coalition came about in response to crimes, including gunfire, which were plaguing the Nicollet Avenue area of uh, the Loring Park neighborhood. Through these two organizations, I've had the pleasure of working with the chief and the MPD. I especially recall his stint as uh, our first precinct inspector where he was, an uh, he was always in attendance at our safety coalition meetings and always willing and open to work with uh, everyone, whether residents or a business owner. It's uh, with confidence that I voice my support for the chief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Michael English, followed by Mr. Steve Kramer. Good afternoon, council members. I uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. And I just want to speak on behalf of my friend, Chief Arredondo. Um, you know, it's once in a lifetime when you come by someone who is so, uh, I'd say, outgoing, so workative. Um, transparent some people say no but I say yes um, and if it ain't broke don't fix it the city council had the the forethought to appoint him to that temporary position continue that work chief Arredondo is a very good man he's a very good leader and he's a friend of most all and I just want to say thank you Thank you. Mr. Steve Kramer, followed by Mr. Kevin Lewis. Great. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Steve Kramer, President and CEO of the Minneapolis Downtown Council and Downtown Improvement District. That's at 81 South 9th Street, Suite 260. Also a proud resident of the Northrop neighborhood, 4832 11th Avenue South. And I really offer two perspectives for you this afternoon on, on Chief Rondo. Uh, for the Downtown Council and DID, the chief has been a engaged and innovative partner for many years wearing many different hats. Uh, he's accessible, he inspires confidence within the business community, he's honest about what the police department can and can't do, what it takes to really make our whole city and especially our downtown safe and, and we all know safety statistics have been heading in the right direction this past year. Correlation isn't always causation, but my sense is that there's something more to that. Uh, there's something about the chief's leadership that's helped drive, drive the numbers in the direction that we all want, whether we're downtown or out in our neighborhoods. So that's one perspective. My other perspective is as a 40, nearly 40-year 40 resident of South Minneapolis, and through that time, uh, the various things I've done have brought me into uh, contact with uh, virtually all of the police chiefs, and there have been a lot of them over that time period of time. But none of them whose, whose kids uh, played softball with one of my daughters at Pearl Park. I was the coach, I think not a very good coach. Uh, Wanda was a little bit rowdy as a parent, but you know, that, that happens. <laughs> none of them who served on the YouthLink Board of Directors with, with me, none of whom 
and many other members of our community because of the heart he has for that issue of, of young adults who are experiencing homelessness, none of whom can, from my perception, walk into any corner of this city and, you know, always be res uh, res uh, engaged with uh, a sense of respect, not always agreement, but a sense of respect because I think people just inherently know that Chief Rondo is, is of, this, of this city. I, I don't imagine there's a harder job in, in this country. You guys have a pretty hard job, but I don't imagine there's a harder job in this city, in, in this country, than being a big city police chief. And the fact that, that Chief Rondo comes to that with this reservoir of trust and, and goodwill, I think, really augurs well for the future of, uh, of public safety, dealing with the very challenging issues that, that we've heard just today and that you hear every time you convene. So I, I can't uh, recommend his reappointment highly enough. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Mr. Kevin Lewis, followed by Mr. Sean Broom. Good afternoon, I'm Kevin Lewis, Madam uh, Chair and Committee Members. Kevin Lewis, Executive Director of BOMA, which is a Building Owners and Managers Association, and I'm here in support of Chief Aradano's reappointment. Um, you've heard some references to statistics and so on, and there have been some improvements. Obviously, we've got a long ways to go in other areas. Uh, the chief spoke before our, our group just two weeks ago, and it had to do with statistics, but also it talked about uh, some of the policing efforts. More importantly were the stories exchanged about what it takes to have a safe community. What I mean by that is we did talk about policing and statistics, but the relationship that the chief possesses with the entities that Steve and some of the others referenced, uh, St. Stephen's, uh, YouthLink, and the others that are providing services to those individuals that need that type of help. And I think it was a, a departure from here's what we're doing to just combat crime. It wasn't that type of message. I can tell you that our 150 members that were in attendance really uh, stood up and took notice as to what the police department, the relationship that they have under the chief's guidance with some of those that are offering service, those organizations. Um, it is important in our world that uh, the employees that occupy the buildings, the tenants and so on, uh, are provided safe environment, but they also live and play in the city of Minneapolis. So we're not just speaking as business individuals from that area, it's for those that, uh, again, live and uh, want to play in our city. So on behalf of our nearly 700 members of the Building Owners and Managers Association, uh, we wholeheartedly um, support the reappointment of Chief Aaron Dotto. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sean Broom, followed by Mr. Paul Besman. Good afternoon, Council Members. My name is Sean Broom. I'm the Director of Public Policy with the Minneapolis Regional Chamber, 81 South 9th Street, Suite 200. Uh, we have heard a couple comments about uh, the successes we've seen in the reduction in downtown crime, and that's very important to the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. But we wanted to come and share our support, our strong support for the, uh, the reappointment of uh, Chief Arredondo for a couple different reasons. Chief Arredondo has shown in his first year and a half on the job that he has the skills to be a uniquely successful police chief in no small part because of his lifetime of experience in the city of Minneapolis from growing up here in South Minneapolis to his decades of serving all of Minneapolis as a police officer he's developed the necessary relationships to lead our police department as it deals with complex and sensitive community issues as important as Chief Arredondo's relationships with the community, it is important to acknowledge the respect that he has from rank and file community members who have seen him stand up to previous police administrations because of the bias that they have shown and who have seen him earn his stripes in every position from a school resource officer to a precinct inspector. Chief Arredondo is uniquely, uh, community members are rightfully asking for reforms to police operations. Chief Arredondo is uniquely qualified to lead the, lead the police department in that direction <clears throat> while maintaining the meaningful relationships with the communities the department serves. On any number of important uh, initiatives, procedural justice, body camera implementation, dealing with the opioid crisis, or engaging with homeless communities, Chief Arredondo has shown the leadership that we need to have as a city. He has shown the leadership that our community members are asking for, and we ask all of you to continue to support his leadership with another three-year appointment as the Chief of the Minneapolis Police Department. Thank you all. 
Thank you very much. We have Mr. Paul Besman, followed by Ms. Crystal Windshield. Hello, my name is Paul Bosman. I live in the Nokomis neighborhood with my wife and when they're not at the university, my two goddaughters. Um, both of them have had negative interactions with the recruiting side of the Minneapolis Police Department. And we've been following up on that. We've had, uh, as, a, as a result of that, I've had interactions with Chief uh, Arredondo, and I wasn't very satisfied. I don't much like him. But that's no reason not to reappoint him. Um, there's been some terrible high-profile events lately with the police department. But that's no reason not to reappoint him. On the other hand, I've sat uh, with the OPCR and listened to the new mental health screening that the chief has put in place. Um, I can tell you that the person who has that contract is very happy to have a city contract and very happy to go forward with any standard that the chief would like to put forward, um, but had no serious thought into what it takes to be a police officer, at least not that she was willing to express to us. And that's the only mental health screening for officers. The difficulty that we have is that's a very difficult job. It's not as dangerous as farming or fishing, but it's an awfully difficult job facing people on their worst day ever. They have double the rate of alcoholism, which is still half the rate of the bar chuck. Um, they have double the rate of domestic abuse to the normal community. And they have high rates of PTSD, as one would expect from a human being who has to do that job. We have no ongoing plan. We have no ongoing plan for police officers um, to deal with those kind of mental health, health issues for any ongoing screening. We're coming up on the contract negotiations for the Minneapolis PD in the next 12 months, and I have yet to see anything from the chief that has any plan for dealing with the mental health of the officers. Um, those people have to interact every day with people, 40% of the people that they interact with are either addicted or have mental health issues. So you stir a pot with people who have a higher than normal rate of mental health stress, with people who have a higher degree of the normal mental health stress, you're going to have the kind of incidents that we've had in the city. We need to have a plan for that before we reappoint the chief. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Crystal Windshield, followed by Mr. James Baduet. Baduel. Okay, let's try this. Um, my name is Crystal Winchell. I'm from the Phillips West neighborhood. I didn't actually plan on coming here today. I just decided like an hour ago. I was watching video of last night's brutal public testimony, and I just feel like the chief and the police department, he's one person. It's not his fault that people, a police officer shot somebody. I think just the, the city council, it's not their fault that people are homeless. I, you, there's social problems that the city council and the police can't solve, and that's nobody's fault. I mean, it's collectively everybody's fault, but I mean, it's not the police department. They're doing what they can. They're doing their job. They have families they go home to. I mean, it's not a really glamorous job. I mean, you're putting your life in danger every day. I, I feel like the police have just been beat up and treated poorly, and it's like, who, we need police. If I'm getting attacked on a sidewalk, I'm not gonna call my block captain, I'm gonna call 911. I just feel like, like there's just, it's become so sad, and the police have such a bad reputation, and it's just, I support the reappointment of Chief Arredondo, and I don't, I don't know, I'm, I can't public speak, sorry, but I just, I, he's one person, I think he's doing a good job, I don't see any reason not to reappoint him. You know, it's hard to lead that many people in a department that I, frankly, I feel like is understaffed. I think we need more police, not less, uh, which obviously a, a lot of people don't agree with, but he's doing what he can, and I think it's a good job. So, thank you. Thank you. Mr. James Baduel, followed by Mr. John Thompson. <clears throat> How y'all doing today? It's good to see y'all again. I got to say right now, I feel kind of different inside of myself. I never disagree with somebody so, so much, but we on the same team. Um, growing up, you know, the police were never good, you know, so to be standing right here, to be in support of Arredondo, that means something. My, my knees are shaking right now. I don't know what I'm doing half the time. But the reason why I say that is because of he put in the work. I lived in the community. 
I do work in the community. I said, if I don't believe in the police, I'm going to be become the police. Started it, cleaning for change initiatives. We beautify the neighborhood, not just to clean it, but to establish relationships. I did that personally. I noticed how he got people out there right now doing the similar work where they're not just patrolling. I see that for myself, where they're changing tires and they're putting uh, uh, gas in the car and stuff like that, where it's about the community part. That's what Arredondo did. I know that. I'm, I'm out there. And when, I'm always one bullet away from Philando, right? How Philando happened. Every time I get pulled over, I still be like, hey, this, this might be it, because I ain't got a gun, I'm a felon. But that doesn't matter because I know that when I have something and, I'm, and, and I need somebody to call, I can call that man and he's gonna pick up his cell phone. Like, what's up, James, you, you good? And that means everything. That's safety and security right there. That's, I know that 60 to 7% of people who get out of prison go back within the first five years. But we got a 90 day pre-release in prison, but there's no 90 day pre-release for the community to accept us. So it wasn't that we wasn't ready, the community wasn't ready. And I know that right now me and Arredondo got some things going on where we're working to change that. I never met a police chief willing to make sacrifices when it goes against all of the other people that he probably work with. So y'all better get a man, otherwise well, I'm gonna tear it up. <laughs> Thank you. We have Mr. John Thompson, followed by Mr. Jonathan Mason. Um, I remember coming here just uh, a year ago, and uh, there was a mayor called uh, by the name of Bessie Hodges. And I remember telling Bessie Hodges and the, the outgoing chief, uh, Janae Harto, you guys are ineffective coaches for the city of Minneapolis. And I also remember coming here just last year and looking around the room and saying, y'all need some color in this crayon box that they call a city council. Um, I also remember yelling when you guys tried to appoint Rondo because I didn't think that you needed to appoint nobody. I was, I was anti-police, anti-police because of what happened over and over again historically with police and African-American men who look just like myself. So today I speak for African-American men who look like myself. We need someone in that seat that looks like myself that understands the conditions that exist in my community. And in order to change the conditions that exist in my community, adding Rondo to the mix changes the conditions that exist in my community. I've never had a police chief ever that I can call and say, man, you got a police officer that lost his mind. And he looks into it right away. I've never had that happen. And under this, 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 this guy right here, and, and I, I feel just like Brother James, I'm shaking because I don't talk about police too well. Like, I don't, I don't, I've never, and, and that's big coming from me. I know you guys know that's big coming from me. You know. But his door is always open to the community. When something happens here in our community, he's the first to come and reach out to the leaders here in the community and give the information that he can and say, look, I can't tell you this. I can't tell you that. And a lot of times we're like, Rondo, you're full of, you know, but you could tell us a little bit more. But at least he is one of the first police chiefs in the community that's a part of the community. And he's ready to change the conditions that exist in our community. I know there's a lot of bad police officers. I can't sit here and tell you that it ain't. But there ain't a lot of bad people in my community. It's good people that made bad decisions in my community that the police run into, and Rondo understands that. Rondo also understands that when we're heckling the police, we're not heckling him himself. We're heckling the uniform and what policing has done to us in my community for years and years and years. So Rondo understands that. We're not talking about you. We're talking about policing. Can you help us change the culture? Because other than that, we don't need you in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Uh, before we continue, I just wanted to acknowledge that we have been joined by uh, Mayor Jacob Fry, and um, wondering if you might be able to stay with us for a little bit to finish the three speakers of the public hearing before we give you the floor. Do you, is, does your schedule, you have a couple of minutes. Would you like to speak now? That's cool. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's all good. Okay. <laughs> Mayor Fry. My, my apologies for cutting in. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm, I've got to, I'm speaking in just a second at a retirement party uh, for uh, one of our wonderful city staff who's heading out. 
Uh, and so kind of the juxtaposition between uh, acknowledging the extraordinary public service of someone who's leaving and the extraordinary public service of someone who's about to be serving their first term, I think, is really emblematic and beautiful. And let me just say, you know, the relationship between the chief and the mayor uh, is arguably the, the, the most important relationship in City Hall. Uh, the value and the necessity that we are handling both public safety and community police relations inclusive of accountability in our city is, I, I believe, of the utmost importance uh, and prioritization in the work we do here. And Chief Arredondo has managed to do something that perhaps nobody before has been able to do which is both articulate and take clear action steps towards a, a shift in the culture of the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, and he's done that through words. He's done that through love. He's done that through clear compassion and passion uh, towards the work that he does every single day. I have never seen Chief Arredondo come into the office without clear direction. He walks in, he stands tall, he's confident, he smells good. <laughs> My staff have this ongoing joke about figuring out where you get your cologne, Rondo, and then, uh, but, but in, no, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, uh, he is what we as a city should be aspiring to be. Uh, you know, Chief, in terms of the importance of people in my life, it's, it's wife, Rondo. Mm. So I cannot tell you how uh, proud I am to put you forward uh, uh, for a full term. Your first full term of, of appointment is Chief. I know you will serve the entire city of Minneapolis with passion and dignity. Uh, and I, I thank you all for coming to testify and giving me the time. And I, council members, I thank you uh, for allowing me the interruption. And I, I do ask for your support. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate you coming in. So we shall um, move forward with uh, Mr. John Thompson. Oh, I'm sorry. Jonathan Mason. Yeah. Thank you. Um, real quick, I would just, I, John, uh, John actually called me and was like, oh, man, Ronald's about to get reappointed. And I was like, all right. Um, but I really think that he is a really good man for the job. Um, I dealt with him a couple times in a couple different situ situations in the city, and I think that immediately he, um, you know, he was very open, and he uh, also articulated, you know, what they could and could not do, and he um, talked to us after I believe it was Justine Demond died, and he, um, you know you know, was willing to listen to us and uh, the people that I was with. And I think that <clears throat> also he's given, you know, his number, um, reached out to him, but you know, it's been kind of a little volatile up here, um, but with the recent activities that have been happening in Minneapolis. But I believe that he is definitely the right chief for the job. Um, I know that personally, a lot of people are like, all right, man, I'm gonna reach out to Rondo, or man, let's talk to Rondo, or even kids or in the youth, um, particularly in North, North Minneapolis, that um, ex express that they you know, um, feel comfortable with Rondo. So that's, that's very nice uh, to hear, um, being a community activist in Minneapolis. But once again, I would say that the co-responder um, program should definitely be put in place because uh, with the, the recent incident that we just seen in the dispatch telling us that the guy was uh, you know suicidal um, we should you know want to have people that have mental uh, crisis experience on the job that are professionally in that um, realm and not, you know, two rookie p police officers. And, you know, it's pretty hard when you're getting a call and then you have two people in that area and then you send them out there and then they're not necessarily qualified for mental health and a person has a knife or whatever the situation may be. Um, but I think that with him being in place um, that <clears throat> these type of programs and stuff like that will be implemented um, within Minneapolis to make it a safer place. So thank you, Rhonda. Thank you. So we'll move on to Miss Jane 
Nash. It's a, li it's a little hard for me to read this. Um, oh, Jana. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jana Metke. <laughs> Yes, that speaks a lot about my writing, huh, Council Member Cano? Hello, I'm Jana Mechie, and I'm the CLPC Coordinator, 1645 Hennepin Avenue South. And I have to say that I'm just coming off of a horrible respiratory flu, and if anybody can get me to City Hall, it's Rondo. I have known Rondo for 20 years. I've known his family. I've kind of grown up with him. He is a wonderful individual. He's a man of character, a man of humbleness. He is so easy to co work with and to communicate with. Um, I watched the hearing last night when I was at home, and I am such a believer of community solutions, but I also believe in policing. You have to have the other side because there are victims of crime. Victims of crime need to have consequences as well, and it's a hard balance. Rondo, over and over again since the 90s, since he was a street officer, has worked on community solutions, a very innovative thinker. He also has worked on community policing. If you look in the Phillips neighborhood, we have Rob Thunder as a beat cop. When I was young, his dad was my beat cop. <laughs> You know, Bobby Thunder. You know, you look in the first precinct, you have Eddie Frizzell, another champion of community policing. So I can't stress strongly enough how much I support Chief Arredondo, and I'm so th glad that the mayor reappointed him, and I'm so glad that you're taking this up. And I want to thank him for his work. Thank you. Miss Brenda Johnson, followed by Miss Lisa Clemens. Um, good afternoon, Council. What an honor to stand before you today um, and say yes, we would like um, Chief Madeira Arredondo back. Um, I'm a native Minnesotan and have been in North Minneapolis most of my life, but I do live on the south side now. Um, I would like to say that I work in two systems. I work in the criminal justice system and the Minneapolis public schools. I am a national NEA director and I'm also a um, an ordained clergy in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. I can truly say that um, Chief Arredondo is the right man for this job. He believes in um, our young people in Minneapolis. Our families have known each other for many, 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 many years. Um, I also can say that when I called him, he was there. When there was a community event in the heart of North Minneapolis at my church, he was there. When I called him to come down to speak to the children of Hennepin County, he came and spoke, and he gave them words of hope. So today I stand before you to say that this is a mighty man of valor. I ask that our community would support him along the way, hold him accountable, but lift him up when he needs it. Um, he can get this job done along with all of us in this room, our community. So I thank you. Uh, to support Chief Madeira Arredondo. Thank you. Miss Lisa Clemens. Oh boy, I got all these dolls on the floor over here. <laughs> so first I want to say, you calling James and them back that quick, huh? <laughs> I got to text some threats to get them calls back. But this is a great man. You all know how I feel. Everybody in the room know how I feel about this man. When I always talk about mothers not having a role, you know, in what's happening in our community when majority of us are single parent homes, we all know that, especially in our community. But when I talk about that to Chief Arredondo and DC Knight, they immediately went into action. When I talk about saving our children, I say you save the mother, you save the child. Kramer, I'm sorry he's gone because I wanted to thank him and thank Shane for working with Chief Arredondo and Deputy Chief Knight to bring mothers in to downtown Minneapolis, to give us a voice down there, to give us a presence down there. That has never happened before, so I'm thankful to you. I always called them my Martin Luther King, that's Malcolm X. <laughs> you, you, have to always, you have to always have that mixture when we're dealing in the community. But uh, Gwen, she's a retired lieutenant, she said this to me when she was a rookie. Rondo said this to her. When people are victimized, their dignity has been stolen, and it's our job to restore it. That's the kind of man he is. 
Thank you, Ms. Clemens. Do we have anyone else that would like to speak today? This is this was the last registered speaker, but if there's more, please come on up. And then if you, yep, you can go after um, Ms. Nakima Levy-Pounds. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Public Safety Committee. I'm Nakima Levy-Armstrong. I'm a civil rights attorney and an activist, and I'm here to express my support for Chief Rondo. Um, I met him several years ago um, in the, at the height of a lot of the activism that was going on in the community. And even out on the front lines, we've had some very tense moments, but he's always remained cool, calm, and collected, and he doesn't take it personally when we raise concerns about police violence. And so while I um, respect Chief Rondo um, and I see the power that he holds in uniting a very divided city, I want us to also be sober about the fact that we have a serious problem with police violence in the city of Minneapolis and to not forget that. This is a feel good moment and Chief Rondo deserves to be applauded for the, the, the issues that he inherited and how he has stood tall in the midst of those challenges. At the same time, <laughs> Chief Rondo is one person. We still have a culture of violence within the Minneapolis Police Department. We also have a misogynistic culture within the Minneapolis Police Department. We also have a culture of racism and white supremacy within the Minneapolis Police Department. As a matter of fact, Chief Rondo joined several other African-American male officers in raising concerns about the ways in which they were being treated and discriminated against and harassed. And they have not been the only ones to file suit against the Minneapolis Police Department because of some of the internal discrimination that has occurred. When we look at some of the demographics, we know that we need more women on the force, particularly black women. From my understanding, there are only five currently across the whole department. So we have some serious work to do. And what I'm asking as a community resident, a resident of North Minneapolis and a business owner, owner there, is for each member of the city council to take personal responsibility for helping to shift the culture of MPD. Rondo cannot do it alone. He is facing off against Bob Crow, who has gotten away with all types of abuse, continues to use abusive rhetoric, continues to intimidate people. That's one of the folks that Rondo has to deal with on a regular basis. He also has to deal with officers who are used to being able to operate in a corrupt and violent manner and who have not been held accountable. And many of those officers who have shot and killed people are still on the force. They have not faced any type of significant discipline. And many of us are concerned about the possibility of encountering them if we have to call 911. So I understand why the community is pushing for community control of the police. I don't like that it is happening now while there is an African-American chief in place because I do believe in Rondo. At the same time, I also know that our city needs to move with the greater sense of urgency. We are tired of having to come here after someone is killed and raising our voices. We want you all to be operating outside of a crisis to shift the culture of the department. As a member of the Racial Justice Network, I echo the demands that have been made, and we would ask that Chief Rondo work with the City Council and the Mayor to implement those demands, and specifically to ensure that there is mental health support specifically for North Minneapolis. We should not be trying to hire more police officers. We need to ensure mental health support for North Minneapolis, and I ask that you all make that a great priority. Thank you, Chief Rondo, for your service to our community. Thank you so much for your testimony. And we have another person who's interested in coming to speak to us. Uh, thank you again. I was up here earlier, but I um, failed to mention who I was. <laughs> yeah. um, but my name is Michael English. I live at 1350 Nicollet. Um, I am the current Vice President of the Citizens for Loring Park Community, and I'm also here on behalf of the President of the uh, Neighborhood Association, Gary Simpson, who couldn't be here because of, um, you know, 
education uh, things that he had to do with. But I do know that he is in support of Chief Arredondo um, in another term. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other folks who want to be part of the public hearing here today? Come on up. <laughs> I don't know why they call me Malcolm X. First, I want to thank the city council uh, for letting me speak today. Um, first, 100% support uh, Chief Arredondo being reappointed. But also, he has to be given the resources to be successful. And I can tell you now, when we look at a police department and uh, some of the trauma faced and some of the officers, and I compare that to some of the trauma faced in some of the communities we serve, you look at North Minneapolis, some areas in South Minneapolis, we have some of the highest disparities in the country. And a lot of times we say police come and solve these matters. I'll be the first one to tell you, police is not always the answer. But we have a lot of people in a lot of communities when you have victims of gunshot violence, they need the police. And I can tell you some of the new initiatives that Chief Arredondo is starting right now. I remember when he created dashboards showing use of force. I said, Chief, that doesn't look good. He said, but it's the truth. You look at use of force, we're probably one of the only departments in the country that show use of force for officers. And I can show you it looks ugly. 88% in some of our north side neighborhoods, uh, African Americans, that's what we use force on. When you look at these dis disparities, you guys are right when you say, if you're a black, you're nine to 10 times more likely to be arrested. But again, uh, officers can't control some of these dynamics when we talk about poverty, education, employment. We can't control those. And then when you deal with the same situations over and over and over again, I'll be honest, implicit bias comes into play. But we can't rob the police department to deal with other issues too. And if Chief Arredondo wants to be successful, all the new community programs we're talking about, if you cut our department by 5%, guess what goes away? Because here's what Chief Arredondo said, we owe the duty to the residents of Minneapolis to serve and protect them. We cannot uh, not staff 911 investigators. So give him, reappoint him, but give him an opportunity to be successful. And lastly, what I say, I said I was here last night for four hours, and people say, were well, you upset because a lot of people were bashing the police? I said, no. Perception is their reality. And one young lady said, let's go in a new direction. My new direction is historically policing has been messed up. Chief Arredondo has a vision to make police better. Everyone in this room can agree we want good policing. So let's have good policing. I don't want bad police. I hate bad cops. We have some bad cops. I won't lie and say we don't. But let's have a system in place where we start having good policing. And I think Chief Arredondo can provide that. So thanks. Thank you, DC Knight. Can we please have our chief join us and just share some comments and thoughts and let us know what you're thinking about as we're, we're getting ready to, to vote on your reappointment. Thank you. Uh, Just a couple of minutes of Chair, your Chair, vision. Thank you. Chair Cano, uh, council members, uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity. Uh, but more importantly, I want to also thank uh, the community that's here. And um, I would be remiss to say that um, the community is here because they want all of those, even those that are not in support of myself or the police department, they want a safer city. They want a safe, a city that's free and reduced from harm. Uh, and they want a police department that they can absolutely trust and, and view as legitimate. And I know that we are not a perfect organization. I know that. And I know that we've made mistakes in the past. Uh, but I want everyone here to know that uh, I'm leading some incredible credible people who come into work every day who want to see the change that you all want. And I want to do all that I can to support them in that. Um, this in a sense is not my police department. I'm trying to prepare the next level of leadership for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years to come. We've got a lot of young officers and employees on this police department and I want to make sure that they have the right pillars of stability and trust. But they're going to need that. Um, we have to also own and be accountable to our history. And many in this room have mentioned that. 
Uh, and I will not shy away from that. But I want everyone in this room to know that I'm inspired by so many of the men and women who come to work every day to do things that they don't do it for the applause or accolades. I've got two phenomenal officers, uh, officers Goodman and Sonby, for example, who have taken their time to work in Little Earth with Native girls who were told that they would never amount to anything, who were told that they would never receive even a GED, that they would be resigned to be unwed teenage mothers with no hope. And I go over there and I see the work that they're doing with them. And when you look at the, the light in these young women's eyes, they have hope. They have a future. They're graduating from high school. They're going on to college. And it's because that two women who wear this same uniform that I do, they cared. I didn't tell them to do that. And that's just an example of the type of people that we have in this department. Now, when I came into this role, I knew that of all the things that I needed to do, it was to build the trust that had not existed in some of our communities and that certainly had been shaken. That is still paramount as we move forward. Um, but I don't take this responsibility lightly, and I'm humbled that I'm honored, and every single one of you here has to hold me accountable, because at the end of the day, I'm responsible for every single person that wears this uniform, and I understand that. But I am doggedly determined to make it work. And um, I appreciate uh, the uh, consideration by our elected officials, uh, and all of you have uh, uh, have held me accountable as well and will continue to do that. Um, but I, I do believe and I am inspired by our city. The fact that all of you are here today means that you care about this city and this police department and you want better for our communities. And I want to be there to help support you in that effort. So I thank all of you for that. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Chief, if you don't mind, we might have a couple of questions or comments for you from the, the council or from the dais. So if there's anybody that would like to say something to our chief or have a question on, we have uh, Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Cano. Um, so you're sure you want this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, most, I'm mostly kidding. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but this is a this is a, this really is the hardest job i mean I, I i look at what you're what you're tasked with doing and i i um you know have been really reflecting on this because we have uh been really looking at many of the challenges and many of the problems and many of the concerns and this is not a job that's going to be judged by uh do we have uh, the police department that we wish we had and that we want to have and is community safety operating the way we want to? You're not starting anywhere close to there. We've got a long way to go to get where we want to be, to get to a place where everybody feels trust, to get to a place where everybody feels safe. And a lot of the issues of trust are deeply structured in the work that we do. And there's no other city that's figured this out, by the way. So we're asking you to solve a problem that nobody's really figured out how to solve. Uh, and uh, we're here to work with you. I'm grateful for the work that you're willing to do. I believe that you're going to move us forward. Uh, I'm anxious to see by how much. I know there's, you know, we've got a lot of things we want to do together. Um, but what I appreciate is that you've stayed engaged, that uh, n not everybody uh, in the city enterprise, when they know we're going to have a really tough conversation, uh, makes a point of really showing up to it uh, ready and doesn't like duck my calls. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, you have been uh, such a good partner to work with especially when we need to have the hard conversations uh, and the honest conversations and the real conversation, conversations about where things need to move, and we are making some progress. Um, so I appreciate your work. Uh, I'm excited to support your reappointment. Your Council to Councilmember Fletcher, thank you very much. Councilmember Ellison. Uh, well, first, I want to say, while I appreciate the mayor's words, he better find room for his mother somewhere on that list <laughs> of important people in his life. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to be supporting the um, your reappointment. Um, I really uh, appreciate uh, what it's been like to, to be in conversation with you and to be working with you um, so early in our term. Um, and... Uh, 
and uh, I, I I have some some mentors in in North Minneapolis, you know, where I'm born and raised, where you you got deep roots there as well. And I think one of my mentors had. Uh, I think their exact words were, "Oh yeah, Madera, he's the homie." So I, uh, I take, I take those words, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and I appreciate them. Um, I also wanted to highlight that I don't want to brush off some of the concerns that we've heard from community today. Um, I want to be able to lift up um, even uh, 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 Mr. Turchik's point about process. Um, and while I don't know that there was a violation of our process here, I think that it the, the point is well taken that. Um, that, uh, that it's not always going to be uh, uh, Arredondo, it's not always going to be this council or this mayor, and so uh, I want to just point out that uh, I'm interested in working through um, uh, a more fair uh, process for how this comes about. But the truth is, uh, as I look at the work that you've done and I look at the city um, and the state of policing in our city, uh, I don't... I don't see a person who could, uh, who could, uh, who's ready to step up into the leadership role that you are in currently, and that we're really excited to to to, to see your leadership continue. Uh, and so, with that, just wanted to name um, that I'll be supporting your reappointment as well. Thank you, Councilmember Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I absolutely echo everything that has been said. Um, in, including uh, the the comments by Ms. Levy Armstrong, but you know I wanted to just identify. I think I've been working with Chief Arandano for about 15 years now, and um, I can honestly say um, that he's not only one of the most committed police officers I've ever met, but one of the most committed civil servants, period, that I've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. And um, I appreciate your um, ability to listen, uh, but not only to listen, but then to take those um, ideas and turn them into action. And, and one of the things that I remember us talking about a long time ago was how um, one of the reasons why we only have five women police officers, uh, black women police officers, is because how the system is created for people to become officers. And Chief Arandando pointed that out to me 10 years ago and then made changes to the post system at the state to allow more people to get engaged in um, law enforcement, mm -hmm. more people from our communities to get uh, involved in law enforcement. So not only does he listen and hear, but he acts. And so that's what I'm hoping that we can count on in the future. I'm sure that, um, that we can. And we are hearing a lot of, um, um, I think, passionate Please, from our community mm -hmm. to really improve accountability uh, of the Minneapolis Police Department, and we're counting on you to help us do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilmember Cunningham. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will be speaking in support of this appointment. Um, I just have to name, I think, a little bit here that uh, Chief Arredondo is a unicorn. And the reason why you are a unicorn is because you, as a police officer, are a unifier. Mm. The police are usually a div divisive conversation, but when we're talking about you, we are all unified on the same page, that your leadership is excellent, and that you have the ability to make the kind of changes as the energy, the drive, the experience to be able to really set a different tone and culture. Um, I also want to name that one of the unique aspects of your leadership is um, that it, it seems as though you rose through the ranks with compassion as a core focus of your leadership as being a sworn officer. And that, again, is so contrary to the image that I think many of us have when we think of officers. The idea of our police chief rising through the ranks with compassion 
rather than an alpha male and you know that like this sort of idea that we see like of thinking of who would be successful in the police department rising in the ranks to know that you did so from a place of compassion is truly powerful um and that is just such a cultural shift um, in terms of leadership within policing. Um, we know that we have cultural issues around implicit bias. I know that um, when it comes to like mental health issues, that sometimes you know there's an alpha male, alpha female sort of like I'm tough and don't want to get help or ask mm -hmm. uh, you know reach out to my colleagues. Um, and and I think that um, starting here with you. Um, being able to have you in that leadership role is setting a different example, setting a different tone, and um, and really, it's up to us to be able to support you to be able to actually then change that and what that whatever that looks like. Um, you're also incredibly accessible and responsive to me as a council member, and I appreciate that. Most people, including a lot of officers that I have spoken to, would agree that the system of policing is broken, mm -hmm. and a lot of a lot believe that it's broken beyond repair. I just want to say that the appointment of Chief Rondo is not only a harm reduction approach to this broken system but it but your leadership also gives me hope and um, so from that from that place I want to ask two questions just so that we can have a, a conversation publicly um, so uh, with state statute you hold the power to discipline officers and hold them accountable so can you discuss your discipline process chair Council councilmember Cunningham thank thank you for your remarks I appreciate that um, yes, uh, per state statute, uh, I do have ultimate authority in terms of uh, administering discipline for MPD employees. Um, there's um, a couple of tracks in terms of how that uh, usually bears out. Uh, probably the, 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 most, um, uh, the most obvious is through a complaint that is received, and usually that is through our Office of Police Conduct and Review. Uh, there is a process that is met early on as a review of that complaint through our joint supervisors, uh, both from uh, the Civil Rights Department and MPD. Um, if they view, after viewing that complaint, they feel it's worth, uh, in terms of uh, further review, it goes to um, uh, a panel uh, that is comprised of two sworn lieutenants and two um, civilians uh, from our community that review that. Uh, they will come back with usually a merit or no merit decision and um, that comes to my, my desk. I will tell you that um, I, I take their review uh, obviously very seriously. I look at all of the information, evidence that they have. There are times when I may ask to see more um, investigative review done. Uh, but when those cases have come to my desk that have uh, shown for merit or that they've recommended merit, um, I have decided in that. So, um, so I have, uh, uh, in its, uh, whether it's been terminations or, or discipline or suspensions, um, that has occurred. Um, and there are some other things where if a matter is brought between a complaint of criminal misconduct of an employee, um, I have taken action there and terminated that based upon uh, what I have seen there. There's consultations that obviously I will work with the city attorney's office on on certain matters, employment related matters, but but that has that has occurred. Um, obviously as, uh, as a chief that is not something, I mean you want your employees, all of your employees to be uh, operating in a manner that is uh, professional and, and doing their best to build the, the public trust, but there are times when that doesn't occur and uh, sometimes the result of that is discipline. So, yeah. Thank you for that. And the one last question um, that I have, uh, there, there were some statistics that were spoken of around officers and domestic violence, and one of the um, other statistics that Councilmember Paul Lozano and I were talking about was also that there's a higher rate of suicide. Um, and we, we have seen that, um, unfortunately, in our own department. Um, and so what plans do you have as chief to address officer mental health and wellness? Chair Council Councilmember Cunningham, so um, when I came into this role a little over a year ago, um, I laid out a vision statement for uh, this department and uh, part of that vision statement was recognizing the fact that we, we know that there are, are community members who have been suffering from both historical and, and current day trauma um, and that continues unfortunately. But what we have not done in the Minneapolis Police Department, and I would also uh, submit to say in policing in general across this nation, is we have not taken a very intentional look in addressing the wellness of our own people who wear this uniform. And we call it the, in, the invisible injuries. 
that many of us will uh, encounter uh, serving this profession. I want to make it very clear that the trauma that officers uh, experience in the course of their career uh, does not mean that they are defective. We have to do a better job of erasing the stigma. We have to provide tools, mental health resources, but more importantly, we have to be able to talk about it. And I, I recall the story that when I was a young officer growing up, and at 10 o'clock at night, I went to a homicide call. At 11 p.m., I went to a baby not breathing. And at midnight, I went to a horrific domestic assault call. At 1 a.m. in that roll call room, when I was trying to process all that, a supervisor walked by me and said, Rondo, suck it up and get back out there. Mm. And that's how we dealt with it as a, as a culture in policing. We have lost too many of our employees because we have not fully addressed, named, talked about uh, wellness. Uh, but that is changing. As part of my vision statement, I talk about, let's, let's talk about uh, officer wellness. It's very important, very important for supervisors to have those conversations. Um, I, I also want to give uh, credit to Councilmember Pamasano, who's also been a, a leader in having those conversations and wanting to make sure that I have the resources, and all of you have mentioned that as well, but making sure we have the resources for officer wellness. It was uh, through her efforts along with, uh, I'm happy to have a leader here, Inspector Kathy Waite, a year ago started uh, mindfulness and yoga over in 5th Precinct. I, I love the funny story that uh, Inspector Wade talked about when it was first rolled out at the precinct. Uh, some of the more veteran officers were like, ah, what is all this and are ah, you crazy? A couple of weeks or a couple of months into it, now they're bringing in their own mats. So um, it's, it's helpful because as Inspector Wade will talk about it in a little bit here, um, it allows our officers for the first time to be in a comfortable space to talk about recharging, resetting, recalibrating before they go back out and interact with our community members. In order for our officers to, to do their best, they have to be at their best, and we, we, we need them, as uh, one of the council members mentioned. If we have a community member that's dealing with trauma and crises, uh, we don't want our employees out there uh, interacting with them in the same way. So we want to make sure that they have the tools and resources and training uh, to do that. So um, that is a plan moving forward. Uh, it has been uh, by, uh, I appreciate the support uh, that the council is considering in our budget to allocate a dollar specifically for uh, employee wellness. So I appreciate it. We have never had that specifically for this department ever in our history. So I appreciate that consideration. Thank you so much, Chief. Yes. Council Member Palmasano. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I have one question for you, Chief, and that's how many years again have you been a police officer? Uh, Chair Cano, to Councilmember Pamisano, it's, it'll be uh, 30 years in June, which is weird because I'm only 25. So. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> um, 30 years on our police force. Um, this past month, or maybe it was two months ago, um, we had a picture of our officers doing yoga in their blue uniforms on the cover of National Chiefs magazine or something like that. Uh, and I'll be honest, it reminded me a lot of my constituent, Justine Damon. Um, I really appreciate the honesty in this room, the honesty that's been shared last night and today. And I think we all acknowledge that there's a lot to vilify in cop culture in our city but also across our country. You know what's the hardest thing to do to change or transform, or a lot of people in this room would use the term reform, policing in our city and across our country? It's about this divide. This widening gap is what I'm afraid of it, between the, the public and the culture of police and first responders everywhere. And I do believe that if you change a culture, you change a system. Um, some think that power is to hold some magic lever over our police chief, over you, um, and they run around looking for different models of that. Um, I've been looking at other police departments too, but I think for different reasons. Um, I'm searching for, and I think our leadership is searching for, a way to transform the culture of policing, um, to lessen that divide. Um, that's something I know Rondo, that Inspector Waite, that Commander Savageo in our training academy and others are deeply dedicated to. Um, our chief said that he's always, in his 30 years of policing, felt the support of the community behind him. Really, I, I've pushed him around on this a lot. Um, and if you remember what I charged Chief Arredondo with, for this job last year, as we gave him the support to carry out the former chief's term, I told him that, at least to me, it will be your biggest challenge 
and accomplishment, I hope, to make sure every employee in our police department feels the same way you do. And if you do that, I think it will bring about a change not seen in many police departments across our country. I voice my support for the reappointment of Chief Arredondo, and my public question, my, pu my question for everybody in this room is how is MPD going to deal with the conflict within MPD of being a change agent? I think that's the hardest thing. For the rest of us here on the dais and in the audience, how can we help? Um, I don't think it's to do budget cuts to our police department, that's for sure. Um, how do we, in our own lives, in our own jobs, deal with the conflict of culture change? I think that's really hard. Are, are you brave enough to do that as well with our police force? I think that's the big challenge here. Trauma has a deep impact on how we all show up, uh, all of us. Trauma confronts us with the best and the worst, and it's part of the human experience. And first responders, like our police officers, have to get especially good at that. And at some point, cops coach other cops through that. Um, it, you know, to me, that's where we need to do more. Um, Maddie and Emma Peterson's godfather, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, sir. You spoke with us last night. You spoke to us today. Um, he mentioned some of the not great things that come with this profession. Um, alcoholism, PTSD, a shortened lifespan. He forgot the suicide rates part. Um, I think that we all in our hearts know that people don't go into this work for their egos, mostly. I think that's the tipping point, and I think we're there. Um, since Chief Arredondo took over this position, I've seen an incredible increase in communication between MPD and the council and MPD and the mayor's office. That's something we've seriously lacked in the past, and it's something we benefit from today. Um, today, I've begun to see a more engaged presence from MPD leadership, and it starts at the top. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the incredible dedication that you and your leadership have shown in com applying compassion as well as leadership as we work with residents like in the Hiawatha encampment on finding permanent housing and resources. And you know what? Compassion is fierce. It is kind and it also holds boundaries. And I think what takes you to the next level, Rondo, isn't that everyone loves you. We already do. It's about those other parts that aren't always kind. Um, Rondo works not just for the public good, but also with the public. That's important. People respond and transform when we as first responders show up differently. And for the public, I need to ask, and I've seen you do this beautifully, we need the vulnerability to grow. And I've seen a lot of vulnerability from people that have come to testify today, and to me that means a lot. The words of Mr. Thompson, um, Mr. Beto L, I don't think he's here anymore, Ms. Levy, Powell, uh, Ms. Levy Armstrong. Um, Rondo's a chief that's still working to lead an organization of peace officers, and I think we have the leaders of this organization we want in place. So thank you. That was beautiful, thank you. So um, Chief, I've had the pleasure and honor and privilege of working with you for the last five years. Um, I first met you when you were um, working for another chief and got a chance to work with you almost uh, weekly on, on certain issues here in City Hall. And uh, I'll just say that um, I couldn't think of anyone better to work with for the next three years to help our communities and to drive change. And I think that most of, um, one of your um, most admirable qualities from my perspective is the fact that you seem to recognize that our moments of weakness are our greatest moments for transformation. And I really appreciate you fully embodying that your words align well with your actions because that's what leads to trust and that's what our communities are looking for the most in uh, members of our, our police department. So thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your leadership, your vision, your positivity. You know that this work sometimes brings out the worst in us and uh, getting up every morning feeling refreshed, putting your best foot forward and leading with your heart is an important reminder for us every day. And you inspire me to work better and harder and I know you inspire others, and this is why I'm happy to move your reappointment forward for approval 
And all those in favor of approving this reappointment and moving it forward to the to the full council, please say aye. 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 Congratulations, and thank, thank you, you very for being much. here. Right, so let's keep this work rolling. So now we are at number 10, which is um, we're going to consider the passage of an ordinance amending Title IX, Chapter 173 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances relating to fire and police protection. So this is the item that reads powers and duties of the fire chief and fire department activities ordinance. This is a public hearing. And so if you are here to speak on this item, please go ahead and take the microphone. Do we have anyone here coming to speak on item number 10? All right, so we shall go ahead and move forward with approval of this passage of the ordinance and the powers and duties of the fire chief. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That item moves forward. Now we are moving on to our discussion items. Item number 11 is a presentation and report about the corresponder pilot project program in the Minneapolis Police Department. So if we can please have our presenter come up and get started, thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Hello. Thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, my name is Kathy Wade. I am the precinct inspector at the 5th Precinct, and I brought to, with me today Dr. Kay Pitkin, who is with Hennepin County, and she works with the uh, emergency crisis and with our COOP unit. So today we're here to talk about the co-responder program. I was here not long ago talking about it, so we're going to give you an update, provide further information, and share with you uh, all that we can and take questions later. So the purpose of that co-responder unit, again, is really to provide effective and compassionate care to those that are experiencing mental health crisis. It's a, we're able to provide and deliver a more comprehensive service to those that are desperately in need and when officers are able to partner with a mental health worker working out of the same squad car responding to calls, it's a win-win for everybody. So goals of the unit, reducing hospitalization and also reducing the arrests of those that are struggling with mental illness, reduce injuries to the officers, the patients, and those that might be involved in a situation where there's mental illness at the core. Reducing future use of force events, reducing the time that non-corresponding officers are at those scenes, and provide a service where there's currently a gap. Disparity does exist in obtaining mental health services for people out in the community. Although there are certainly providers all over the city of Minneapolis, it's not always so easy to acquire those services, and the co-responders are able to come into a situation and provide those connections for people in the community. The resources. The co-responder team consists of two sworn MPD officers and two mental health professionals from Hennepin County COPE, the Community Outreach for Psychiatric Emergencies Team and Child Crisis. Due to a recent retirement and a transfer, we are currently down to one team. That co-responder unit currently has two unmarked squads that are equipped with lights and siren and a squad computer. The team's currently housed out of the 5th Precinct and they take calls out of the 3rd and the 5th Precincts. The team members wear what we consider a soft uniform, so they're wearing a polo shirt, navy pants, and they continue to wear their duty belt. The, uh, the technology requirements, of course, are computers, both in and out of the squads, and COPE also provides county computers. They operate Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Here's photographs of them and their squads. You can see the uniforms that they have based on that, the polo shirts. So day-to-day -day actions of the co-responder teams. The teams, they monitor the 911 calls that are made in the 3rd and the 5th Precinct. And at, at that point, they also are able to be dispatched to those EDP calls. 
Their EDP stands for Emotional Disturb Person Calls, and those are the way that our CAD system uh, classifies them. Uh, the officers that might be responding to other calls might determine that there might be a, a need for a community member to receive additional services. So they maybe aren't necessarily dispatched to calls, but officers can make a call to them, both either on the air or over a telephone, and ask for them to respond to calls as well. Team members provide outreach also with the unhoused community that are located in the 3rd and 5th precinct. They go and do spend time at a number of encampments, including the larger encampment along Hiawatha. These team members also have participated in community meetings, and they do do site visits at area facilities that provide services to those struggling with mental illness. So this might, I'm sorry, it's going to be tough to see. It's um, a little bit tiny, but I wanted to give you an idea as to what a typical call is for a call responder. I hate to use the word typical because there really is no typical call, uh, but uh, as far as throwing it onto a flow chart, this is probably the best way to do it. So a 911 call would be received by our dispatch center. It would be determined to be perhaps that EDP call. A two officer response is always required on all calls involving those struggling with mental illness. From there, after they are dispatched, the, uh, the corresponder team may very well hear that call. Perhaps they're dispatched as well through MECC, or else it could be that the patrol officers recognizing the situation are reaching out to the co-responders to also join them on that call. The primary or two-person squad responds to the call, ensures that the scene is safe, and then that co uh, and patrol officer co-responder team will come in and assist on that call. At that point, they release that primary squad, that two-person squad, to go back into service and continue taking calls for the day, and that co-responder team stays on site. There are three different things that they can handle the situation next. They can do an on-scene assessment with the patient, taking the time to determine, can that client stay in the home? Do they need some additional support services and need to be transported to the hospital? It could also be a second opportunity um, in providing an alternative solution for that client. Perhaps it's a situation where they just need um, some more support from family or friends. We can transport them to a different location to get that additional attention. Uh, perhaps it's a situation where they need to see their, their therapist or physician. We can provide them with that service as well. That transportation piece oftentimes alone can be what throws folks into crisis because they don't have opportunities to get to where they need to be to serve their needs. And finally, it can also be determined that patient maybe is just not in a place right now where they can receive that assessment on scene at their home or at their place of employment, perhaps out on the street. So this is an opportunity for them to be transported to a hospital. What we determined is the follow-up piece is really critical. It's something that the police department didn't provide in the past. Uh, it was really a significant gap in services. It's something that I first recognized um, years ago on the street. Um, I've been on the job 25 years. I started when I was five. Chief. Uh, so, you know, it's something that we always recognize out there, that we want to be able to do more for people, but what do you do? Um, particularly, particularly when officers are working at night. Um, also, when I think back to when I was on the SWAT team and working as a crisis negotiator, uh, there was one instance in particular when we had a gentleman that was out on a bridge. We managed to talk him off the bridge and get him the help that he needed. Uh, later that day, we had another 911 call, and it was a party on a bridge. It was a different bridge. It was that same man. And you know, there's just there's a gap of services. We want to be able to follow up on those cases, and that's something that the co-responder team does. A significant number of calls that they make are follow-up calls. Uh, for example, you know, these teams they work Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. 911 calls continue to happen right over the course of the evening and on weekends and holidays. Every morning when they come in to start their day, they review all of the EDP calls that occur during the hours when they're not there. They then take the time to reach out to the community members whenever possible and see what more they could do for them, whether it's phone calls, arriving at their homes, uh, just making that connection with people. 
Uh, so again, it comes from uh, 911 calls for service that occur when they're not around, when the teams aren't available. Sometimes it's just based on clients' needs. Maybe it's a prior client that they've said they'd follow up with that person in particular. We also receive tips from friends and family, uh, patrol officers, community members that might be concerned about a certain individual that's out in the community and they feel they might be in need of, of mental health services. And that's something that Dr. Pitkin brought up to me was the stabilization services. So when those clients come out of the hospital, what happens then? This team takes the time to go out and reconnect with people, see are their needs being met, are there connections that need to be made, and maybe they need longer stabilization services that could be provided by the regular COPE staff, and that's a connection that they are able to make. Inspector, we, we might have a question uh, by a council member. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair and Inspector Waite. You, you went through the, um, the diagram flowchart of what a typical, not typical call looks like. Um, but, you know, one of the examples you identified was a potential suicide mm -hmm. on the bridge. And, you know, um, in the most recent case um, of a police-involved shooting, the person was suicidal. And it's my understanding that co-responders would not have been able to respond to that particular call. So I'm, I'm just trying to get clarity for myself. When will co-responders involve themselves in um, really traumatic situations where a person is threatening to, I mean, that seems to me the most important time to have a, a mental health professional on the scene, and yet it sounds like protocol is that they are not involved in those kinds of situations. Madam Chair and Council Members, I can speak to that. Um, what it's a complicated set of issues that are going on here um, that probably weren't fully fleshed out in the press, but there are many different levels of safety and times when someone can be um, effectively treated by mental health therapy versus safety is the primary concern. So um, what we'd like to do is to be able to see people before we get to the point where safety is really the primary concern and there's not much else that can be do, done until the safety is, is secured. And that's why COPE would not be in that type of visit because there was a weapon involved, immediate threat. And these are mental health professionals. Um, they aren't able to be able to defend themselves in a situation if somebody is going to use a weapon against them. So there has to be um, no weapons and have it be a safe environment. And, and then also um, sometimes talking is not the answer that the person needs hospital level care and needs to um, go there for some more intensive treatment. So there are a number of different scenarios. They're all different and they have to be handled based on the level of safety and the level of care that's necessary to be able to address the situation. I mean, please forgive my, I don't know, thick-headedness and aptitude, I don't know what, it, but it seems to me if it's a co-responder and they're responding with the police who have tasers, batons, guns, Kelvar, steel toe boot, like, I don't, I'm not clear how safety is a concern in that situation. Say something Unless I'm not clear on how the co-responder works. I mean, if it's co-responder, that means police and the mental health professionals are responding. That's right. And, you know, a lot of what they provide, though, when I talk about the gap of services, is that just that we're trying to avoid future events like that. And by reaching out, to people right away as quickly as we can and providing this resource, 
potentially will be preventing situations in the future where force might be used. Uh, the design of this program is patterned after programs that exist across the country. Uh, we recognize that there's a volatile nature in any 911 call. And with these teams, we do have to keep everyone's safety. We have to keep that in mind. We also don't want the partners to react in a negative way because they all of a sudden have this threat. I don't want the officer to back out of a situation because they feel the need to protect their civilian partner, right? I need them to be uh, comfortable in the environment. I, I need them to provide the services that are needed and necessary. So this program is not designed to be handling extremely volatile, violent situations. They're here to partner together to provide a service as often as they can to those that are in desperate need for that level of support. Uh, that's not designed to respond to those types of calls. So 100% will not be co-responder calls. The majority of the calls that are gone out on are the officer and the mental health professional together, but there's some where it isn't safe for that to happen. And what we'd like to do is bring the number of calls down that are like that. And then another thing we'll get to in a little while is that um, there are services available to the community that are not through 911 and the co-responder model. And they're used quite widely by the community. They can directly call in and get um, the mental health side of um, the service. So that's what we want people to do. We want people to get health care from a health care pro provider and not have to get to the point where they're calling 911. But we also don't want people who are calling 911 to fall in the gap in the system between mental health and law enforcement. And you know, while we're making referrals, the person is getting um, more and more ill. So we want to make sure that there's a good coverage of that gap but then the public can choose not to talk to the police about it, but go right to the providers directly. There's no additional charge to them for any of the services. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, so here are the ED so calls. We have one more question from oh, Councilmember Fletcher. Okay. Thank you, sorry to interrupt, Inspector. That's all right. uh, just to follow up on that, so, if someone is concerned about a loved one, there's a number they can call to get only the uh, healthcare response. So if a call came in um, similar to, you know, what we know from the public about the 311 call that got transferred to 911 call um, uh, with Travis Jordan, uh, how, if it had gone to that number instead, how, how would they have responded? Would they have sent health care providers and, and not a co-responder? Well, if there was a weapon involved, then they would have, <clears throat> the co-responder or the mental health person would have had called an officer and had the officer go with them to assess the scene before going in because um, we can't send people that don't have weapons into a situation where weapons are involved and expect that we're going to have a good outcome for our staff. We need to protect their safety to an to a certain extent, and that's a very small number of the calls that that happens for. The majority of situations, people want the help, they're receptive, they didn't know how to get it, they just need someone to connect them. And I also wanted to address the concern about suicide that's been expressed. Um, the staff that are doing co-responder and the rest of my staff that do the rest of the city and are the direct access mental health professionals have been selected by the state to practice zero suicide. And this is an evidence-based practice that is used nationally and internationally to be able to reduce the likelihood of suicide in a variety of different ways. And right now we're just working on that within our area. We're, we'll start to branch out over time and involve others in it. But part of it is that follow-up piece. The follow-up piece is just good business. And then it's also suicide prevention built into every interaction that takes place with someone who may or may not tell us that they are feeling suicidal. And about a third of the people that we see in the community 
are thinking about suicide and are somewhere on that continuum. And this includes youth, and youth have a higher rate of suicide, and we're really focusing on youth quite a bit. And the police calls that we're going out as part of the co-responder group it are the highest um, number of cases are for people that are having issues related to suicide. So suicide in our community is a significant issue and um, ranks up there with opioid crisis and sometimes more than an opioid crisis, but I think is a very sensitive topic for people to discuss comfortably. And I'm just gratified to hear the discussion that's gone on in this room that indicates a level of comfort with mental health. Sounds good. You can keep going. Okay. Thank you. So next is the slide for uh, the ADP calls, emotionally disturbed person calls that we've received in the city since January 1st of this year uh, up through the 25th. Now, please keep in mind these are strictly EDP calls. They're not maybe check the welfare calls or domestics, car accidents, or anything else that may involve someone that's struggling with mental illness. It was just the EDP calls. So as you can see, um, it just went from, if you look from left to right, it starts with the first precinct, second, third, fourth, and fifth. Um, for those in the audience, the first precinct is, covers downtown, second precinct is northeast, the third precinct is the south side, everything to the east of 35W, fourth precinct is the north side, and the fifth precinct is the other south, kind of the southwest portion of the city, everything west of 35W. Uh, next you'll see these are the EDP calls, it's the density of calls, and that covered uh, the past two years, November 21st, 2016 to uh, November 21st, 2018. So this depicts the entire city, and you see in the yellow, orange and red, that is where we have the highest density of EDP calls. Inspector, we have a question from Councilmember uh, Cunningham. Sure. Thank you, Inspector, and thank you so much. Um, so the map that I recently got around EDP hotspots, so it's CAD reports of EDP, um, EDPs, it says hotspots 2016 to present, I sent it to my colleagues as well. Um, it's There's a lot more happening on this map, and you can really see it more clearly that it's not just this particular area. Um, so I'm just curious, like, so when you, why am I seeing different data sets that are pretty dramatically different? Sure, these aren't all the calls for service. This is just the density of calls where they're occurring. So this is what I was provided with uh, regarding just that density. It is not all where all the calls for service are. As you see in the previous slide, See if I can go back. So that's where all the EDP calls are happening. Okay, those are not all the. They're not dots on the map, right? This is just where the density of the calls are happening. And then just a close up of those calls. And that density map. A question. All right. So sorry, I have another sure. question. So why are we using call density as the data set because um, if there's greater density, of course there's going to be more calls it, like on top of each other. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean necessarily that it's it, like this just inherently works more than for denser parts of the city um, <coughs> and far, parts of the city that are further from downtown then just won't see that level of density. So right. um, I'm just. Uh, I'm concerned as like a low density area, I, and and when I look at the overall amount of calls, a huge portion of my um, like my ward where we look mm -hmm. at the hot spots for the calls, it, there's a lot of red in, yeah, like on the north absolutely. side. Absolutely. And so, um, so it, can you just explain to me why density? Sure. Well, as you can see, that I'm going backwards a few slides, we're not ignoring the calls for service and where they're happening. I mean, it's. It's very evident where the where the bulk of the calls are without looking at, at the map. The density map is just presented so that you can see where, again, like you said, it's the highest volume of calls are happening. These calls are happening all over the all over the city, all over the county, and all over the state. It's not unique to any particular area or region. 
It's just allowing you to see where the density of those calls are happening. Um, by no means am, am I not, uh, I don't mean to be ignoring the fact that these calls are happening everywhere, because they most certainly are. There's a significant need for additional mental health services all over this country, and there are people that are desperately in need of it. Uh, so whatever it is that we can do as the co-responder teams, uh, we are eager to do that to make sure that we are bringing services, especially gap services that I think exist everywhere. We, if we can fill those gaps, that's going to be a successful situation for us. We need to provide these services to people and make sure that we have the opportunity to provide them with what they need. Oh, council member, just if I can add into that comment, I hear you saying that there might be different population densities in different parts of the city, and so if we have a lot of calls coming from somewhere, that doesn't mean there's a higher rate of calls. And there's another way to get at that data. It's the number of calls per 10,000 residents, and um, we also have some county and city maps that are for the overall mental health response, and I'm sure the city data could be worked in that same way. Great. That, I, that's kind of where I'm, I'm thinking of sure. is like per capita, um, you know, when we think about just literally yeah. people stacked on top of more people <laughs> in apartment buildings or congregating downtown is just inherently then more people in one area. And right. so, but if we think about population wide, that's yeah. what I'm concerned that this data could be hiding. Right. So, sure. Thanks for that clarification. I appreciate it. So if we look at the next map, that one might help too. So this one, and I'll let Dr. Pickin uh, talk about this one, but you'll see on the left is the county, the entire Hennepin County, and then on the right is the city of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is, um, this is not uh, per 10,000, so it won't get at the concerns, but we do have that if that's of interest. But this is the unduplicated clients, which means if someone had five calls, we only count them once. So it's like talking about the people that the teams have seen during the year 2017. And um, the, I think the other maps that we look at are fairly similar. It's just that when you start controlling, especially for the outer parts of Hennepin County, um, it, it really does change the figures quite a bit. But what we tend to see in our Minneapolis maps are kind of an S-shaped um, dark concentration of people who are getting mental health services through the mental health channel. So uh, there are a number of neighborhoods on the north side, south, central, into west, southwest a little bit too, that are, um, a lot of people in those areas are receiving mental health services already. We use this information too to take a look at neighborhoods that might need some outreach from us to help them to know what to do in the course of a crisis and how to crisis plan with their family members and you know just connect them with resources that are going to prevent crises from happening whenever possible and keeping people out of the hospital if we can do that if they need to go to the hospital we'll make sure that they get there but our goal is to put a number of um, supports and services and connections in place for them so they can stay in their home, they can continue to go to their job, they can stay in their school and community and not have to be out in a facility getting treatment because it's not necessary in most of the cases. So again, this is just the map of what Hennepin County COPE, their service area that they've <laughs> Uh, where they provided that service. You know, uh, earlier there was a question about who could they call if they aren't comfortable calling 911 or don't feel that need. Those numbers at the top, those are the numbers that they would call for that support. It's 24-7, 365 days. So the measures that we have uh, that we've been maintaining, we've kind of changed and evolved with this over the course of the past year uh, and found that there's some additional information we'd like to have on hand, and I know that Councilmember Cunningham, you helped me with this and and asking some really good, thoughtful questions. And so uh, this is the current design that we have. This is just the sheet that the uh, police officers maintain. The COPE staff they maintain separate paperwork from us, and we are not we don't intermingle that data. Mm -hmm. And we are comparing to see is the group of people that are coming through 911 different 
than the people who make their way directly to the mental health professionals. We don't really have enough data to say anything about that at this point, but it's something we're watching. All right, so speaking of data, here's what we have. Uh, we look to see what we had acquired over the past year. So knowing this was a pilot project, we wanted to see all that we had. I presented some of this to you uh, the, on the previous time that I presented here, and now we've got some updates. So we have had 985 contacts that were attempted with the co-responder unit. Uh, that was again between September 11th, 2017 to September 1st, 2018. This was not just 911 response, but it was also the follow-up calls that the teams were uh, partaking in. Of those 985 contacts, 843 of those calls were to adults that were struggling, and 142 were for juveniles. Of all of those calls, 193 assessments were completed on scene or on site. Uh, that's, a, that's huge. That's a significant number of people that were served in their home that didn't have to go to jail to be arrested in the hopes that they could seek an assessment. Those are folks that didn't have to spend time in the hospital, didn't have to board an ambulance. They were able to get that service right in their very own home. And from there, referrals can be made. They don't have to go anywhere to receive that service. I think that's critical for us to recognize. And of all the contacts that we have made with the co-responder teams, there were to only two incidents where force had to be used. In both of those situations, the client was uh, in such crisis that they had actually assaulted the officers and takedown techniques were used so that we could get them on, uh, on board the ambulance so that they could receive additional services. Next slide. So this here is going to give you really the best indicator as to what's happening when they have responded out into the field. Of the clients that were seen, nine, uh, all 985, some again, some were not home. You'll see that here. But of the ones that we did see, 264 of them were able to remain in the home. 189 were transported for care at a hospital or a care facility. There are a portion you see in that kind of greenish color where they did not receive any services. That was because they didn't answer the phone, perhaps didn't come to the door, or maybe they were gone when we went to check on them. Please note, there were no arrests made in any of the contacts that we have had. Also, the community response has been so positive. People are constantly asking us when they can get a co-responder, and you know, it's a good question. And we try to explain to them they don't have to wait for a co-responder. They could be calling directly to the mental health, but they really like the co-responder pair and see that as very powerful. When people call 911 now, they're actually asking for the co-responder team. So that's, I think that's really exciting. Our recommendations are that we move this program forward. It was a pilot project. We'd like to see it become permanent with the city of Minneapolis. We'd certainly like to expand into the first precinct. I'd like to expand into all the precincts, baby steps. But uh, I know that Mayor Fry had included this in his 2019 budget. We're excited about the prospect of working with all the agencies downtown that already exist, along with the hospitals, uh, the unhoused community that uh, oftentimes will travel into downtown for additional services and support. And we're excited to move forward in that direction. Inspector, we have a question or a comment from Councilmember Palmasano. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Inspector, wait, I'm curious just because there's been a lot of um, fast moving conversations and I don't know if um, your own leadership opinion on this has changed or not, but um, my understanding with this co-responder pilot model is um, it's still in its infancy a bit. And as we learned today, there's a lot of misunderstanding as to when co-responders in this model actually shows up. Um, and I'm curious, do you think that it's it would be wise to all of a sudden next year take this from the pilot program to a full-blown citywide program? I do think it's wise because I think it's needed, but it won't happen overnight. Uh, you know, 
we have the benefit with the police department of having a lot of staff that is a great resource for us. And backfilling for staff doesn't have to happen instantaneously. I'll let Dr. Pickin talk about the COPE aspect of this and, and the necessity of backfilling and doing additional hiring for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely becomes a resource issue, I think, and that's the main barrier for people to have co responder. I think everybody would have it if there weren't that barrier. It's kind of hard sometimes to con con convince the public that, you know, it's worth paying more taxes for and so on. So um, I think that's been a challenge. Um, one of the things also about our staff is that they are 40% people of color. They speak 15 languages, and if the co-responder who is out there does not speak that language, they can um, call somebody back at the office who knows how to um, provide mental health services in Somali, in Spanish, in Hmong, in whatever language is needed, or use an interpreter. So um, we've just really tried to make the bar to get to these services as low as possible because typical services are um, a person has to show up for appointments and not forget them and arrange their transportation. And sometimes when someone is ill, they just are not able to get there. So um, to be able to provide uh, services in someone's own language, culturally appropriate, and the ability to find resources that are going to be culturally appropriate is a really significant concern of ours. If I may. Um, so then um, I think what you're both saying and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that expanding this co-responder model because of the need to backfill other people to <laughs> add co-responder models, would it also take more sworn officers to be able to deploy this across the city, Inspector Waite? Yes, it would. We would need uh, an officer in each of the precincts to provide the service along with the COPE staff member as a partner. Thank you. And then my last question is, um, Recently, I don't know how recently, um, all of our officers have finally gone through the crisis intervention training, the CIT <laughs> model of training. And I think that in to some, um, the public perception of when co-responders show up is really when a lot of that crisis intervention training is, is what comes into play and it's with sworn officers in situations. And I'm curious, have we had a chance to really see any impact about what, what my question is what kind of impact has our CIT um, our crisis intervention training had and is that a bit is there any ability to separate that from the corresponder model sure no that is a complicated question uh, I don't know honestly has it had a, an impact I would say absolutely any additional training that we can provide for staff is always to our benefit. You know, whether it means that they successfully talked somebody out of committing suicide, maybe it doesn't have to be to that degree that they're using that skill set, the de-escalation training in particular. You know, we use those skills every day when we go to domestic calls, when we just get to um, bar fights. I mean, every day we are called to scenes where there is confrontation between parties, uh, whether it's confrontation with the officers themselves or between two other parties, we're constantly using the skills that we have acquired. Uh, and so is CIT critical that they've all received it and beneficial? Absolutely. But I don't know exactly how we'd always measure that. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'd have to talk to the folks that have been impacted by it and talk to the officers. And, and I can tell you that the officers that have gone through the training that have talked to me about it have found value in that. Uh, what the co-responder brings that it is different is the mental health worker and being able to connect people to services the patrol officer may not be even aware of or recognizing some of the signs and symptoms of other things that are happening with that person. Maybe there's some additional support that needs to take place not only with that client but perhaps with the family members or loved ones nearby. So it, it's, um, it adds additional layers to the services provided when we can bring that COPE staff member along with us. Thank you. And just for clarification, um, you mentioned de-escalation training. or de-escalation training and our crisis intervention training one in the same thing? They are not. It, uh, it was just, again, another layer another. of the training that they received. Yep. I know there's a lot of training, so I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Uh, 
I was asked about the citywide deployment and what that would look like. Thankfully, I've got Robin McPherson here, who is uh, the finance extraordinaire. Uh, but these are the slides related to that, and so I would say if you have a lot of questions about that, that I've got Robin here to provide any additional support. Uh, the mayor did propose and making this permanent with the co-responder program with the, in the third and the fifth precinct and expanding then into the first. Uh, the county has received a federal grant to support that first precinct downtown uh, co-responder team. Uh, and that would be a five-year federal grant. And I'll move on to the next slide and I'll just move out of Robin's way. We have a question or comment from Councilmember Cunningham. Sorry, I was trying to catch, catch you before you transitioned over. I wanted to ask about a process question. Um, so the, um, so I know that when there is a call um, and that, that still officers, two officers have to clear the scene for or something like the it's a it's a uh, scene, safe scene so I'm curious um, and one of the concerns that I've had is that that essentially makes officers still a gatekeeper to accesses to resources and so um, slight uh, but like you know thinking about what role do officers inherently have when showing up to an already escalated situation and then that maybe turns into a weapon, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. um, do you, from your perspective, like are there other opportunities for us to be able to um, maybe have those direct connections rather than having to go through the police department? Um, so yeah, what are your thoughts about that particular gap? So I have a few thoughts about that. So again, if people don't want to involve police, then they wouldn't have to make that 911 call. They could call COPE directly. Again, it's a service provided 24 seven and thereby eliminating the police from the call. Um, as far as could it escalate once officers arrive prior to the co-responder team arriving? It certainly could. Uh, I, anything can happen on these calls that we go on, but I have to say, most often what we're seeing, if things change once the co-responders get there, it's been that folks have been transported to the hospital immediately upon the officer's arrival. And so the co-responder team doesn't have a, an opportunity to do an assessment or anything. Um, they don't go code three red lights and siren to these calls, the co-responder team. And so they, are, they do inherently arrive a bit later, generally speaking, than that primary squad. Uh, Thus far in the third and the fifth precinct, I've seen a, a really good relationship. I see that the co-responders will uh, be familiar with some of the clients out in the community and will thereby tell that primary squad, you don't need to respond, we'll take this call. So that does happen too. Uh, historically, does that always happen? No, but if we have a relationship already established with that client and the co-responder team is confident in the situation, they will respond as the primary. Uh, this particularly happens uh, with some frequency at a lot of the facilities because we have that additional support from the facility staff. And so there are times when that is happening, particularly with um, New Way and uh, some of the other service agencies that we just go to with such frequency that we've felt got great relationships with. And, and there are those times that that happens. Did that answer everything? Yeah, we got there. I appreciate okay. it. No, yeah. that was really great. Um, and then I have a question um, for you, Doctor. It, it would, would be, um, is there a connection between 311 and 911 at the city to COPE, to be transferred over to COPE? Um, well, there is, a, there is a law that permits 911 to transfer calls um, directly to crisis teams. It isn't used very much in our experience because um, the calls coming into 911 are a mix of um, some calls that are probably riskier than ones that come directly to the mental health route. So the 911 and 311 areas tend to be reluctant to have it go right to the crisis team. But that said, they will at times not necessarily directly transfer the caller, but notify the crisis team and ask that the person check in with the caller. 
Great, thanks. Again, wanted to make sure process and systems mm -hmm. that they're connected in the right way because, you know, I, for example, not having been a council member, maybe not wouldn't have known about COPE, for example. And so if, if I or somebody that I knew were having a mental health crisis, I wouldn't necessarily think in that moment of like, I should contact the county. You know, like it's like, all I know is that I'm in an emergency and I need to call 911 because um, I need help and that's what you do when there's an emergency. Um, and so I guess I'm just kind of thinking about accessibility to make sure that kind of those lower level um, incidents, maybe you're getting transferred over rather than having to go through the whole process and tie up squad cars and all sorts mm -hmm. of other things. So thank you for that clarification. Yeah, and also 911 and Inspector Waite and the officers are very closely connected with us. So we see each other at regular meetings and we talk about situations and what kinds of situations should, should go where and so on. So there's really excellent coordination going on between the city and the county crisis teams. All right, the floor is yours this time, for real. <laughs> Madam Chair, Council, Council Members. Um, as, as Inspector Waite pointed out, the mayor's proposed budget includes permanent funding for the third and fifth precinct, pilot funding for the first precinct, and then um, an additional unmarked car, which of course they're using uh, every day. Um, in the next slide, some of you may have seen this information, but we wanted to understand what it would take to expand to all five precincts. And with the addition of the COPE grant that they received, and by the way, that grant is specifically for the first precinct. It is not for any other precinct, just the first precinct. So what it would take is if you included two additional officers, that amount would be a one-time fund, or I'm sorry, an ongoing funding of $618,000 a year and one-time funding of 72,000. If you did not, if you just reassigned officers who are currently on the street to this for all five precincts, it would cost the city $440,000 total. So the one-time funding is specifically for the vehicles. They're approximately $24,000 a piece. The remaining funding is for the COPE contract itself. So there's no payroll, there's nothing else in here. It's strictly money going out. So. And I think the only thing, and I brought this up a, a couple of times is this is, this is what would happen for five years at the end of that grant period. That would be another discussion, obviously, at that point. Thank you. Is this the end of your slides? That is the end of the slides. Okay, just, just wanted to check. Yep. Um, Councilmember Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all so much for this information. Um, so I wanted to um, get some additional clarification on um, when we have, can you just explain to me the contracting aspect of, of with the city paying on contract with COPE? Can you explain to me um, why we are contracting rather than um, the county being able to pay for that? Can you just clarify that for me? Um, I don't know that I can speak to that, to that issue. Um, I think it would be something between the council and administration at the county to discuss the contracts. But I can tell you that the contracted amount um, covers the pay and benefits for the staff and we have the best staff we could possibly put out there for the community. These are master's level and PhD level independently licensed um, mental health professionals that have lots of training. So, you know, I, I've had questions before about is there a way to trim this down? And there's not really. So, you know, I think we just have to make those hard choices and think, you know, do we want to keep it small? Do we want to go big? You know, just it's, it's hard choices to make, but certainly I know county administration would be interested in having conversations. Yeah, definitely not looking to skimp it down, looking for ability to be able to grow it up. So just wanted to be able to get um, a little more clarification about just like that process and logic. So thank you so much. Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Kanu. Uh, so the flow chart for the typical call for co-responders, you listed a two officer response required per policy. Right. Is that department level policy? Is that... Um, Department level. Okay, great. So that is something that we could look at if we think that 
uh, we want to change the way we think about responses to um, mental health calls. Yes, I imagine we could. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then I guess my other question for you is, I, I think I'm still struck by, in thinking about um, how this response happens and uh, thinking about this, it always feels to me like when we hear that someone is considering suicide, um, sending people with weapons is like the least intuitive response to me. Um, uh, to, to bring something deadly into a situation where somebody's pondering their death, it just doesn't feel like the right thing. And so I, I've been trying to think about, are there, um, are there still gaps with this co-response? Are there things that as you think about, there are, it sounds like there are calls where this is exactly the right model, um, where we have uh, an officer and a mental health professional showing up together and being able to handle situations uh, in ways that are more compassionate and effective, and I think that's really good. I'm supportive of this. I, I uh, also want to see it citywide. I also feel like there are still gaps. I also feel like there are still situations where this is not the response that would be ideal. And so um, that's what I'm feeling in my guts. I guess I'm sort of curious for, for you having uh, been involved in the execution of the program, where are the places where you feel like there are still gaps? What are the other things that either the, either the city or the county uh, still need to be looking at to be able to respond in the best possible way to each situation that we're called to? I think the gaps exist simply because of the fact that it's only located and available in two precincts. It's the most obvious gap to me. Uh, will they always be available? No. I mean, if they're sitting in a home doing an assessment and more EDP calls come out, they're not leaving that assessment to continue taking calls. Um, is that a gap? Well, I guess so, but I want them to do that assessment. I want them to take that time. And so other calls may have to sit. Now, again, those are calls that will be you know, deployed out to other officers. And that's when we have the opportunity to go and do the follow-up with them. So that follow-up care is always a critical piece to this. And you know that is where I feel the gaps in the past are now being sealed. Uh, I think in any kind of response, there's, there may be gaps that exist uh, just because people leave the home and now that person's no longer there, so we can't perform the services. So I guess that's a gap, but we can't necessarily contain that situation. Um, I think that the teams are doing really an outstanding job. Uh, where in the past we were just putting people into an ambulance and sending them down to the hospital. Now these teams are spending time with clients. They're taking the time to help them uh, learn tools and tips as to how they can deal with what they're facing. Uh, a case in particular was a, a woman that's living in a facility and she calls 911 a lot. Uh, and and you know, how do you curb that, right? We can't necessarily change that behavior, but we can provide her with some tools on how to deal with some of the anxiety that she faces. And how we did that, how we got her to the place where she was comfortable to talk about, about what she's facing was the team sat down and played Yahtzee with her for 45 minutes. That's not necessarily something officers are gonna be able to do, right? They've got additional calls coming in. They're not always gonna have the time to sit down and play Yahtzee. This team did. They were then able to break down some of the barriers, provide her with some additional support and resources, and give her some of the tools that she needs so that when she's feeling anxious, now she has a toolbox and things that she can do differently so that maybe she doesn't need to make that call. She doesn't need to be seen at the hospital time and again. She recognizes that, but she didn't have any other options. Now here's an option for her. I think that, you know, again, we're providing a service that was not in existence before. Uh, there will always be gaps because people are sick one day, people are on vacation, but I think the best that we can do is to continue to work with our partners, provide the resources available, recognize that there's further referrals that can be made, and work with people in advance of that crisis that might happen in the future. And the Yahtzee game is an example of engagement strategies that need to take place for some people who are not getting the care they need. It has to be a slow process and one with trust. And I think in the pie chart, seeing the people who weren't there when the team went out, well, it might be the next time they called and the team went out, they were there. And it was kind of a test to see, you know, 
do they care? Are they going to be coming? Will they fire me if I don't show up? All of those kinds of things that actually happen to people in the mental health system, they might be expecting that will happen to them, but we don't fire people. We go out and take a look and try to engage and see um, what they're ready to do to be able to change things. I do have a comment and a question. Um, so the the cope, the, the I guess the raising awareness around the the connections to cope and and the fact that folks can call that directly and avoiding the nine one one scenario. Um, I think that we uh, at the city can certainly use a lot of our different platforms to inform community members that that number exists, get the number out there in more people's hands or, or radar. Um, you know, our NCR department has multilingual outreach that they do with, um, um, you know, Spanish language radio stations and with Somali media. And then we also have the neighborhood and community relations uh, annual conference where I think we can certainly promote this information and, and work uh, with our own communications department to get information out there, especially when we think about, um, you know, if there is like the uh, Mental Health Awareness Month and so forth. So th I think there's things that we can work on to promote more of the resources and support networks that are established out there for folks to lean on. Uh, but putting that aside, I'm, I'm curious. So if somebody does call COPE directly and, um, and, and somebody's saying, you know, there's, there's somebody who's uh, threatening to commit suicide and they have uh, a knife or a sharp object or uh, I'm not quite sure what other things, you know, would, um, would be used in a situation like that, what's, what's, what's your protocol or process for responding to a, a phone call like that? It would be a very close assessment of what the risk factors are in that situation. If there's somebody present who can help to mediate the situation, if the, um, the things that the person has at hand are very lethal, you know, just a number of things that uh, they would go through and assess. And depending on what those answers were, there would be a decision about whether there, there needed to be police involvement or if this is something that one or two crisis responders can handle with putting some supports in, in place while they're getting to the scene. But, you know, we don't want anybody who is imminently at risk for um, killing themselves to be um, waiting for the team to show up and not getting emergency um, services right away. The COPE staff don't have bells and sirens and, and um, just it takes them, a, you know, some time to drive there, just as, as any of us would have been mm -hmm. driving around the, the city or the county. So if we think we can't get there in time, then we would send somebody else to make sure that the person is going to be safe. And um, in that assessment that happens when the you're taking the call and trying to decide, you know, is it us that go out there, do we need to call 911 or an officer? Um, do you have, like, um, how... how no, I mean, um, I don't know if I have the right words for the type of work that you might do, but it, how formal or informal is that process? Is there other people involved? Um, d does it take two minutes to assess? Does it take 10 minutes to assess? Is there like a chart and you kind of go through like step one, two, three, and four, and this is where we're at? I'm just trying to understand or get my hands around like the what it looks like, what that process looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and th there are topics that the person addresses. Now, how they address them might differ quite considerably depending on who the speaker is and, you know, what their needs are for the communication pieces. You know, um, in some cases, there can be a really clear communication. In other cases, the person might um, not be able to track on the situation or report what's happening or anything. So, you know, the, there are core um, spheres that are the topic of questions, but the way that looks could be very different depending on both the situation and the caller. And um, that's where the clinical skill comes in, is that there are some checklists for sure, but a lot of it has to do with the improvisation that needs to take place that is very individualized to the person in the situation. Do you feel comfortable um, giving a time to that? Like, does, do you think it takes five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes? I'm imagining someone on the phone doing this kind of intake situation. Yeah, and it, it could be um, just about anything. I, I don't mean to be unresponsive about that, but it could be that somebody finds all of that information out in one minute and has made a decision about what resources to bring to bear. And it might be that there's a lengthy conversation, 30 minutes or whatever, in which the person is trying to get information from 
um, the community member who is um, just really gradually and carefully letting information come through about what's going on with them. So sometimes it takes a very long time to do that, but that's part of the engagement strategy is to make it so the person feels safe talking about what's going on with them and can get the help they need. So just to clarify, um, you, you do take calls from both people who are reporting other people mm -hmm. who are threatening to commit suicide, and then you also take the call from the person themselves who are, who are, who are saying, I'm considering doing this, can you help? Yes, and we say it's the person themselves or concerned others. So anybody could call and say, I'm really concerned about my family member. Mm -hmm. Would you mind um, trying to get in touch with them and see how they're doing? And, and the team will do that. Okay. And you know, they're, if the person is not interested in not having any issues, they're perfectly willing to go away and, and not intervene any further. But uh, sometimes we have found people who are very, very seriously in need of hospitalization and the family member was right on and mm -hmm. or the community member was and we've had phone calls from um, county board members about people in their neighborhoods and you know we're all a community and we have to look out for each other and that's part of the looking out process for people with mental health issues that are mostly homebound. Thank you, I appreciate it. So I'm wondering if uh, there's any more questions here from the council, and it looks like we, we don't. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to give us another update on this uh, important topic. Uh, we as a council will be um, delving into our uh, budget uh, process soon, maybe tomorrow. And uh, uh, we appreciate you um, bringing this information forward to us before those discussions um, and actions begin. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so, you so much. much. Thank you for the opportunity. So uh, let's see here. Uh, all those in favor of receiving and filing this report on the correspondent pilot project, um, please say aye. 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 And now we will move on to our next item, which is um, item number 12. Uh, we're going to receive a report and presentation on the classification of an access to police body camera data. And we have staff here ready to go. So please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Kano and committee members. I'm Christian Rommelhoff. I serve as the Assistant City Clerk and I lead the Records and Information Management Division in the Clerk's Office. I'm here with Deputy Chief Henry Halverson, who leads the Police Office of Professional Standards, and with Mary Zenzen, Manager of the Police Records and Information Management Unit, um, as well as Carol Bashoon from the City Attorney's Office. So we're here to present on access to body-worn camera data under the Minnesota law. I'm going to first present an overview of the relevant law specifically discussing who may access body-worn camera data and under what conditions. Deputy Chief Halverson will describe the police policy and procedures showing how police implement the law. And then finally, Ms. Zenzen will walk through a number of example scenarios demonstrating how all of this comes together. So first, it's important to understand where the rights and restrictions come from. Access to government data is controlled by Minnesota's public records law called the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act. It can be found in Chapter 13 of the Minnesota Statutes. The law balances transparency on one hand with privacy protections on the other. This balance sets up a natural tension within the law. The law makes government data public by default, but creates numerous categories of data that are not public, as well as classifications that apply in certain circumstances. So when the states charted a balance between privacy and transparency, the city is unable to change it. So if data is public under state law, the city has limited ability to, to create privacy rights. So basically, the state law makes data public, and if it's requested, we must provide it. Similarly, if state law makes data private and it's requested, we must protect it. So there are provisions that may change the data's classification in certain circumstances, or which allow a local government uh, some discretion to provide or protect data if specific conditions apply. We'll talk about some of these today. These, though, are limited in number and are typically narrowly interpreted. One main takeaway should be that the state law sets up the framework and any rebalancing between privacy and transparency really requires revision of the statute in the state legislature. So um, I did want to uh, kind of set a context here. We're talking about body-worn camera data here. And this is different than other audio-video data, including other police audio video data. So we're not talking about squad car videos, street camera videos, or videos collected as evidence from private businesses or individuals. So 
there are two kind of initial concepts that are important to understand when we're talking about access. The first is that a data subject, meaning the people who the data are about, may have different rights of access to the data than the general public. And a good example of this is I can access my personnel file, the general public cannot. Um, for body cameras, the law specifically defines who a data subject is. And it's uh, the folks shown here in the slide. So it includes the officer who wore the camera, that would be the number one there. It shows uh, anybody whose image or voice is documented in the footage. So this is the folks in two with the person off camera and then the group in, uh, you can see in the upper right hand corner. And finally, it includes any officers who Image or voice is documented in the data, regardless of whether the officer can be identified by the recording. So this would be an officer number three here, if maybe it's only the blue shirt got caught in the video frame, would still be a subject. So the, the second key concept it's important to understand before diving in is that data collected by a law enforcement agency, including body-worn camera data, may be part of a criminal investigation. And if so, a provision of the law changes the classification of the data, temporarily restricting access. So under state law, criminal investigations have a status of either active or inactive. Uh, the additional restrictions only apply while the investigation is active. So to know whether body-worn camera data can be accessed, we need to understand whether it relates to an active criminal investigation. So the, the items shown here on the slide really, when one of these occurs, a case moves from being active to inactive. And this, some of this happens at the city level, the MPD level. So if no case is opened or if the case is closed without being referred to a prosecutor, it becomes inactive. The rest of these occur once it leaves the city and continues on with the prosecutors, whether it's uh, the, uh, another investigative agency or like the Hennepin County prosecutors, for example. So prosecutors, um, it, it's active until they make a decision not to charge or until they determine they cannot charge because the statute of limitations has run. If uh, a charge occurs and a case is opened, then it is active throughout the case until the final right of appeal is exhausted. So the case, any appeals, or any you know, chance of appeal, is, the time is up on that. And finally, if nothing else, um, the case becomes inactive 30 years, after, uh, 30 years after the event has occurred. So because a lot of this occurs outside of the MPD or the city's role, even determining whether a case is active or inactive can take some time, and take some effort. So with these two key pieces of information, I think we can dive into uh, this chart here, which talks about who can access police body camera data um, if no special circumstances apply. And so under the general rule, it's the body cam data is classified as public, uh, I'm sorry, uh, non-public or private. So in, with this classification, law enforcement personnel, may, uh, such as MPD investigators assigned to a case, have access based on a business need and pursuant to a written policy. The law is silent on issues such as whether involved officers may view video prior to writing a report and instead defers to local policy. Um, Deputy Chief Halverson will discuss MPD's policy as well as how uh, BCA policy affects access when that agency is conducting the investigation. So in the second line, the data subjects, and these are all the people we saw on the prior slide, uh, basically people who are in the video uh, by image or voice, uh, they have access, but only if there's not an active criminal investigation. If there's no active investigation, or if one, there is an investigation, one of the events that we talked about that would make it inactive happens, then a data subject may submit a request and they would have access to view or to receive a copy of the data. Um, and finally, the third line here, body-worn body camera video is not available to the public under the general rule at all. This means that the public does not have any access unless a specific exception provided for in the law applies. So now we're moving on to some of those exceptions. So there are some circumstances that change the general rule and provide for additional access to the video. Under the public benefit exception, law enforcement agencies may release investigative data um, and body-worn camera data to the public or to an individual if the agency determines this will aid the law enforcement process, 
promote public safety, or dispel widespread rumor and unrest. Deputy Chief Halverson will be talking about how the MPD uses this provision later in one of the example scenarios. Uh, several of the other provisions here affect access in the context of a trial or a court order, so under the kind of direction of a judge. Criminal defendants have access for the purposes of the trial. Judges may provide for additional access under the rules of discovery. Um, in addition, any person may bring an action in court for access, for their access to, or for the public release of body-worn camera data. And in this case, the judge will review the body-worn camera data and weigh the benefits and harms in releasing it. There's another set of exceptions, and these actually change the classification of the data depending on the content uh, or use of the data here. So the, uh, the video becomes public if it documents an incident in which an officer discharges a weapon in the course of duty, or if it documents the use of force by an officer that results in substantial bodily harm. So if, for video that has, that documents this, this type of content, anyone may request access to the body-worn camera data and we would provide it. However, if this data is part of an active criminal investigation, it would remain confidential or protected until the investigation becomes inactive, like we discussed earlier. Once one of those events occurs that make it inactive, the public can obtain access to the video. So this reflects how the state law uh, took an approach to balancing the need for transparency with the operational needs of law enforcement and prosecutors. So the last uh, exception here is the subject of da data, if, there are, if it's not part of an active criminal investigation, the subject can view the data, they can get a copy of it, they can also request the data becomes public. And if they do so, the city must redact the images and voices of other individuals unless we get consent from them for the release, um, with the exception of police officers wouldn't be redacted and they would remain in the video unless they're undercover officers. The, uh, the last piece of the law here I want to talk about is privacy protections in the law. Like there are some exceptions that make the video more accessible, there are some that uh, increase privacy protections. So generally speaking, these allow a court a uh, law enforcement agency or a data subject who does not consent to release the ability to remove some data from a, a body worn camera video in certain circumstances. And I can address any of these if you have any questions on them, but um, otherwise, I think we'd move next to the uh, police policy, how MPD policy really intersects with this. And so I'd like to introduce Deputy Chief Halverson. Okay, um, Chair Cano, Council Members, uh, Deputy Chief Howerson with the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, appreciate you having me here. So uh, I'm gonna discuss a little bit um, uh, the application of the uh, policy as uh, uh, we have had it uh, in our, our third year, as you see there. Uh, I think it's important to understand that um, this technology is still relatively new. Uh, it's been We've had it in our department for approximately two and a half years. It'll be two and a half years coming up at the end of 2018. And that was six months for the pilot project of, of uh, uh, testing out two different systems. So <clears throat> the vendor that we chose, the equipment that we used, we've had for under two years. Um, I think it's important to understand that because this technology is so new, and it's so um, 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 still in development, are, or still adapting, that laws and policies are really adapting. So we, we are adapting our policy, as you see, in just two years, we've had to change the policy three different times. And, 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 and I, I could probably tell you that within the next year or two, we may have to add some other things to the policy just because the way uh, uh, the technology is changing. So just to cover the policy a little bit for you, um, um, the activation piece of the policy. Uh, activation piece primarily uh, states that um, officers will dispatch it when they're dispatched to a call where, where they have some type of self-initiated 
um, uh, activity. Uh, some law enforcement, any type of law enforcement action or investiga investigatory contact. Any type, of, any type of situation where they believe there may be an adversarial situation. Um, or when directed by, by a supervisor to do so. So really our activation is there's a, it's pretty much on a, a, a large portion of the officers days that they're working and responding to calls, talking to citizens, talking to business owners, um, um, or uh, um, being inside the squad car. Uh, notice, so we, we asked the, in the policy, we asked the officers to, uh, when feasible, to advise the, the people they're interacting with that they have the body cam on. Uh, we realize that that's not always um, available to do so because sometimes we have to respond in emergent dynamic situations, but in most cases um, uh, our officers can advise people that they're speaking to, people that they're dealing with, that they have the body cam on. Uh, and then also sometimes people will see maybe uh, I didn't bring some of the equipment, but the body cams have a red light. Usually that's when it's on and you can hear a beeping that makes a sound. So uh, that can also indicate to people that it's being uh, on and it's uh, recording. Uh, some policy, uh, as, according, as according to our policy for deactivation, uh, primarily an uh, officer can uh, deactivate when they believe we've reached the conclusion of an event. Um, at, uh, or the conclusion of, of interaction with a citizen or, or, or a business. Uh, also for critical incidents, uh, so it would depend on critical incidents and, and, and what we're kind of focusing on here uh, for this presentation is um, officer involved shooting. So if we had an uh, officer involved shooting, our, our officers that were involved and any witness officers um, what we ask per the policy is that they keep their body cams running after the incident until they've given a public, sa public safety statement. And what the public safety statement is, is information to the uh, responding supervisor, uh, the incident commander that gets there, basically tell them where, if, if, if they had gunfire, where they shot. Um, if there's anybody else that may need, that's either in danger or any other suspects that may need to be uh, apprehended or where there could be possibly some, some physical evidence. So those are the three topics we asked for the critical incident, or I'm sorry, for, this, uh, for, the, uh, um, for the public safety statement. After that, the involved officers and uh, um, witness officers uh, could then be advised by the incident commander to uh, deactivate their body cams. Uh, for deactivation, we ask that sometimes, you know, we, we understand that our officers were human. We're not exactly, we, we make mistakes. Sometimes they thought they turned the camera on and didn't turn it on all the time. Maybe the battery went out and they turned off. Um, they're going to, a, a driving to a call and, and again, um, thought they turned their camera on, but it, it didn't happen. Um, or when they're dealing with someone and it accidentally turns off. Uh, we ask that the officers just document that active deactivation in, in the uh, CAPRAS report if they're going to be able to do it, uh, or note on a, uh, their CAD call, uh, uh, adding a message or adding information that their uh, body cam was deactivated. So the access uh, to the body-worn camera data um, will definitely vary. Um, uh, well, access to access to body worn camera data obviously can vary because we can have, as you saw before, uh, which uh, Christian spoke about, we can have um, we can have our officers uh, have access to their incidents, to what they uh, uh, responded to, and to what they needed to report on. But we could also possibly have not have access. Um, um, DC is, Halverson? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just giving notice that <clears throat> there is another meeting scheduled here to start mm -hmm. at 4.30 p.m. And so I'm wondering if there are any pressing questions from our committee or any last slides that you might want to highlight or go over. Um, I was not anticipating having to move out of this room before sure. 5 p.m. So apologies, I didn't check that as the chair of this committee. But um, if there are questions that folks want to ask 
quickly now, or if there's one last slide or two that you want to go over. <coughs> The last slide before the Excuse examples me. is just the, uh, it, it deals with the, okay, sorry. The last slide before the examples deals with the critical incidents not investigated by the MPD. Would you like me to finish with this one or any other questions that you have? Um, Councilmember Ellison. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, D.C. Halverson. Um, I, um, I just had one question. You know, there's been some uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, tension during some of the police-involved shootings around the fact that officers get to view the footage, um, and you know, members of the public feel like they're not given access to the footage, and officers get to review the footage. Uh, it uh, from the beginning of the presentation, it sounded like uh, what I'm hoping is was clar uh, clarifying. Uh, is that a, it's not necessarily the, that the officers have some special officer privilege to view the footage, but they're in the footage, and in the event that the person that they were engaged with is deceased, is that why uh, other folks are not able to view the footage, or do officers sort of have a special privilege to view their own body cam footage? Uh, do, does, does the question make sense? I, I believe so. I think there's two two parts. I think Mr. Romanoff could probably answer one part better, and I, okay. I could answer the other part better. Okay. So on the first part, of the, under the law, officers are subjects, um, but as subjects, they wouldn't have access during an active criminal investigation. Okay. So the officer's access purely comes from this, this other part, law enforcement um, personnel's access. And I think Deputy Chief Halverson can speak to that. Please. Yeah, well, it, um, as uh, Christian stated in his uh, information he was given, it is uh, – there's no law that states, not, no law addressing this at all. It, it okay. comes down to policy, okay. policy level decisions or policy written by agencies. And, and so um, um, our current policy that we have with, um, uh, if we are doing the investigation, we use our current policy. However, if, if the BCA is using it, we will um, follow, uh, have them follow their, or they follow their own policy and procedures. Right. And then just for my own clarity, it, it, are officers allowed to view the body cam footage before they're like giving a formal statement? Just so, uh, yeah, that's. Cur yes, cur currently, currently with our policy, okay. uh, yes, they are allowed to watch the video before giving a, before doing a report or giving a statement. And then like last question, if, if somebody is claiming that they've been the victim of a police assault, are they allowed to watch the footage before they're giving their, their final statement? Um, let's say something, something traumatic maybe happened and they're missing a few details. Um, that, that may depend on if the, I'm not sure if you're talking about if it's a custodial arrest criminal or whether it's an administrative case. So I'm not sure that may, de that's why it may vary. It may depend. Okay. Uh, let's, let's say they're, they're, uh, uh, you know, allegedly uh, engaged in criminal activity, but they are subject they are somebody that's uh, been captured on the video, uh, and there's sort of like a dual claim that they're criminals, they're claiming that they've been assaulted. How does that get hashed out? Are they able to see the body cam footage to maybe help solidify um, uh, uh, their case before giving some kind of formal statement? Before giving a formal statement, so again, are they, or would they be, so if, if a person's arrested, they have the right to remain silent, so if they're, right, 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 okay. right, right, so if they gave a statement in that one, is that what you're talking about, or if they gave a statement for, like, a complaint? Um, uh, during, in the instance of a complaint, let's say. During, during, if, during the complaint? In the, yeah, in the instance okay. of a complaint. Then, uh, then, yes, if they were making a complaint, and they came in to inter internal affairs, and made a complaint on an officer, yes, they, they would, yes. Thank you for that, Claire. Okay. So I'm just going to wrap it up here because... Um, I think we actually got incorrect yeah. information. Oh, okay. One second. Chief, Chris, I'm sorry. Chair Connell. Yes, you, uh, Chief, please. Councilman Burleson. So my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Christian, the individual, as you described in that situation, would not be allowed to... to no, correct me if I'm wrong. That, that's good. If there's an active yeah. criminal investigation going on, they are a data subject, but they would not have access during the active criminal investigation unless it was in the context of a court case. If they were a criminal defendant, they would, or if they were in a, a situation where the judge could issue an order to give them access through discovery or something else. Um, if there was not an active criminal investigation, as a data subject, they would be able to have access. Yeah, um, yeah uh, I, I thought that's what you meant when we went to the second one. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm just kind of watching the clerk here. Is there anything else that you needed to say to wrap up? 
No. Okay. So, um, so what I e did is email our committee now, and, and um, because I know this is a, a subject of high interest in in our communities, uh, what we can do is uh, consider bringing this, bringing this conversation back up. Um, next year and in the meantime we could also have meetings and discuss a staff direction work with our chief to figure out if there's other things that we want to highlight or improve or change in the information that we just received um, so I want to thank you for coming before us today and preparing this information I know there was a lot of uh, time that went into it and and staff were uh, really engaged um, so without um, more time for further questions we're gonna have to receive and file this report so all those in favor please say aye Hi. Hi. Uh, there is no more business before this committee, and we are adjourned. Thank you so much.